All right, here we go. Phase on love. Welcome to Vlad TV. Fine. Can you? Can you? Okay, I see. The, the <laughs> drum machines and the drums. Like, why the drums? Can I ask you that? Um, can, it, it's just the studio that we use. We uh, like started using the studio, and it's like a rehearsal space. Copy. I just well, I was curious. Like, why the drums? Yeah. Is that a yeah. Simple? There's no. Uh, there's no hidden meaning behind it. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a, a studio that we ended up using that we stuck with, and it's just that was the backdrop, and we kept it. Convenience, I got you. Yeah, convenience, laziness. <laughs> well, we've been talking about doing this for like what three, four years now. Yeah, I was telling. Yeah, I'm. I'm, and I, I apologize. Every, you know, I was telling him, I was like, Nah, man, I gotta, we gotta really show up for Vlad because he's been asking me for years, and I've been that close. I've been in New York on the way, and some. Bullshit happened, you know. I was like, yep. you, you've, been, you've been kicking ass. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think you ended up in the hospital last time, uh, before the last Yeah, interview. that was like two years ago. Yeah. I was like, uh, so I couldn't breathe with some bad pussy. I don't know what it was. <laughs> 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 it was like, I know, I checked my, I was, like, <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> you know. Okay, so this is your first time here, so I want to get into your whole story. Right. Now, uh, you grew up in, I guess, San Diego and New Jersey? Right. Well, yeah, yes. My father's uh, military, so uh, we came to New Jersey first, then Harlem, then San Diego, and then I would go back and forth, uh, like some summers, to stay with my uncle in the Bronx. And, um, yeah, so ended up staying in the Bronx, of uh, Boynton Avenue, eight seventy five Boynton. I think my mother, my mother used to work at Chuck Full of Nuts. That was her first job here. Uh, you don't know about that, Chuck Full of Nuts in Harlem. Yeah, the, the coffee place. Yeah, why you know about Chuck Full of Nuts? I, I used to live in Jersey. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, that's a Jersey thing, I think. No, it was actually in Harlem too. She oh, worked, it's a Harlem thing also. Yeah, okay, well I know I know it was like a New York yeah, kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. But she worked at the one in Harlem. Yeah, around the corner. Okay, so you were bouncing around a lot as a kid. Yeah, well, yeah, because um, I was the firstborn, and uh, my father was out, um, you know, whatever, on the Kitty Hawk. And, uh, you know, my mother, you know, she, you know, she needed help, so. And, you know, family, New York, Newark, Harlem. San Diego is where we land, ended, ended. Okay. And I went so, back to New York Yeah. in the 80s. Yeah. So growing up, were you a good kid? Did you get into trouble? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I used to think my father was mean, but I understood he had to discipline me because I was doing some foul shit, like some, you know, you got to understand, we... Uh, on my street, it was nothing but boys and maybe two girls, and and all you did was fight. And you know, if you didn't, we didn't have Nintendo and shit back then, to, until eighty two or something. you know we got Atari, that bullshit Atari shit. But all you would do is fight and play football, ride bikes, fight, play football, ride bikes. You know, you go to New York, fight, play, <laughs> play football, play stickball. <laughs> Steel bikes. <laughs> okay. I mean, all kids fight to a certain degree, but how bad were your fights getting? We, I mean, it was, we became a set. We, 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 5800 block Old Memory Lane. We, we, it was, uh, that's how a real set is really the, the kids that grew up on the block. It's not like you, you know, you start rapping and you just claim a set. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like you from that street. And you guys go play football against somebody else, and they, if the fight breaks out, you better be swinging when everybody else is swinging. So I was, but I would, you know, as a kid, I stabbed a kid in, in the neck with a pencil. As a, as an idiot, I saw a, a pistol on this. I was a, trust me, my the, you know, there's a black phone. At the in at the at the in the teacher's um room sits right behind her desk, and she would call that phone and call my father, and I'm like, oh, shit. This is it. 
My father came. Everybody knows about this story. My father came to the school and whooped my ass in the bathroom. Everybody from Dago knows. <laughs> whooped my ass in the bathroom. Back then, you can whoop your kids. They didn't give a fuck. They're like, yeah, have that mo- straight that motherfucker out. So, yeah, my father came to school and whooped my ass. We laugh about it now because I was like, man, my father mean, but no, he had, he was disciplined because I was I was I was a asshole. Well, you you stabbed a kid in the neck with a pencil. I mean, that could have turned into a murder. Dumb shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like dumb shit. Just like like what the fuck? And that's I mean, my mother. I mean, uh, yeah, we dumb shit. I I remember my first lesson on don't ever underestimate anybody white people but everybody can whoop your ass was we uh we had this thing called the veep program where they would take black kids and put them in white schools in um san diego they would bust them so ours was lewis and people from my block went to lewis so our <laughs> uh uh, homie Chris, you know we didn't we the black kids, so you know we you know we yeah I wish I wish you know we walking around you know talking shit, and um a uh, guy named Lance, not, I mean, we still friends to this day, white guy named Lance ride dirt bikes, and um I went in there and I wanted his seat in the class, and uh, he, he was like, this is my signed seat, I'm like. Get the fuck out of the seat. Lance, I know the teacher assigned me to the seat. I socked Lance. If Lance didn't whoop my ass up and down that schoolyard <laughs> till I was tired, I was like, get this white boy off me. <laughs> the whole, so everybody in my set was like, you let Lance whoop your ass? So Chris, big homie Chris went over there. And trying to put Lance on him, put hands on him, he was like, ah, that white boy can fight. <laughs> <laughs> but we all became friends. That that was like our first lesson to like, oh yeah, just because he white, the, hey, that, that don't mean he, yeah, he was putting hands on him. Nice kid, man. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm actually looking like, it up. Lance would always bo- come to school with a broken arm because he'd ride dirt bikes back then like you know like really tabletops and all that shit that's how i got introduced to dirt bikes well i actually looked it up you were born in cuba well we can't talk about that because you got a president sending motherfuckers back (laughs) (laughs) okay i'm gonna leave that alone i'm gonna leave that alone it's the paperwork is a little sketchy Hey, I wasn't born here either, man. I might get sent back too. We both, we both might get sent back. How's your paperwork? <laughs> uh, pretty good. Last I checked, but you know, you never know. You never know how things work out. You know, you catch that wrong charge, I might get. Uh, you know, they might shine me. You know, like the big homie Shine got sent back to Belize after uh, <laughs> after he got out. Remember that? Yeah, but and that's when it was nice. Yeah. Uh, have you ever been to Belize? I have not. Uh, it was beautiful. They got the best fried chicken in the world. Okay. He's like, I'll take your word. I'll take your word for it. Well, I mean, yeah, because Shine's dad was actually the, the, the prime, prime minister, minister over there. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty crazy. Oh, yeah. Okay. So you actually started doing comedy at 15. Yeah. Four, 14, actually. 14. Yeah. Okay. Were you always like the funny kid? I was. We, we had this thing we did called Basin. We would sit under the lights and talk about each other's mama, and that would end up in the fight. So whoever... <laughs> we would talk, you know, I was good at that. So, uh, and my father always listened to Richard Pryor albums driving around, and I would act like I was not here, like, I don't know what's going on. But I would be listening like, <laughs> Richard Pryor, Bicentennial nigga was a problem. I was like, oh, this just, oh. And I would go to school and repeat that. So, um, one year I was about I was back in New York and me and my uncle were sitting on the bow on the terrace in eight seventy five and um 
we're watching Eddie Murphy on his, they said this thing called uh, uh, HBO's Laugh Out, something like that. Laugh, laugh, whatever. And Eddie Murphy was on there, and I was like, oh, hell no, that's what, the, that's what I want to do. I said, just do it. I said, how you do it? Where, where you go to, where you go? He's like, you gotta go to a comedy club. So when I went back to California, I was, I was like, I'm gonna find a comedy club. <clears throat> and, um, my buddy Earl found the comedy club in La Jolla, the comedy store. He's like, they got a place there, kind of comedy store. You can go there and, um, and, you know, get on stage. Uh, and I, I, we went down there. We put four dollars in the tank. Took that trip from Southeast, and um, I was hooked ever since. I was like, Oh no, this is what I'm doing. And that's where I met Polly Shore. Polly Shore thought he was a, a break dancer. <laughs> Polly Shore drove a Corvette and. <laughs> Back then, I don't think he had a license. <laughs> he would drive a Corvette on the... He would park in front of the comedy store on the concrete, on the sidewalk. And I was like, who is this motherfucker? And back then, before you... I couldn't go in the club. I had to wait outside. So whenever I performed, it was like, okay, Faison, you're about to go on. Go do my little two, three minutes and go right back outside. When Pauly came, he was like, fuck that, man. Come in here. <laughs> he got to wait outside. And uh, that's where I met Mark Brazil, good friend of mine till today. We created the 70s show. Huh. Um, Third Rock from the Sun. He wrote on uh, uh, In Living Color. He's one of, the, one of the best writers out there. Okay, so you were basically doing open mics in the beginning. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Which, you know, looks easy until you actually get on that stage and all those people are waiting for you, you know, to make them laugh after. <laughs> My first hey. time on stage, I, I, as a comedian, you, I, 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 I felt the bug, but all comedians feel this. There's a light when you, that you can't see. So you're going like this. And then when you get accustomed to that light, you get into the groove. There's a light that's bl a blinding light on you, spotlight. So I was like, you know, I remember doing this and doing my jokes, and I was like, damn, this feels like when the police stop you. Ah! <laughs> 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 you know, it's La Jolla. It's, it's all rich white folks out there. So that that was one, yeah. But um, what was, what was, your, what was your question? Well, you know, you start out doing open mics. Yes. Definitely. Did you have any really bad bombs in the beginning or hecklers or that type of thing? Of course. But that's how you get good. I mean, it's not until you go to the black crowds because, you know, with black crowds, you, you better be ready. They don't give a fuck what kind of, what your process is. You got to be ready. You know what I'm saying? Um, uh, <laughs> my first uh, all black crowd was with me and Robin Harris. Um, he came down to host. This is for people who know who Robin was. Um, this comedy, I think it was Bees, Bees, some, some, some little rinky dink place, held about maybe 40, 50 people, and I had some red shoes on, some red boots. Um, and he talked about my boots so damn bad when I got on stage. <laughs> <laughs> I went downstairs and took the boots off and threw them in the trash. <laughs> I was like, man, don't ever let me buy no goddamn red boots. Uh, yeah, that was my first. Uh, and then going up to the comedy act in um, L.A. But yeah. Okay. So yeah. Bunch now of, I'm. Um, Well, you end up being on Def Comedy Jam. Oh, what year was that? Shit. 92, 93. It was after Bebe Kids, I know. Okay, so so that's what I was going to ask. So so you doing uh, 
Robin Harris's voice on, on Bay Bay's Kids. That was before Def Comedy Jam? That was before. I be, it was before around the... It was before. Um, it was before. Because Robin died in um, 90, 90, March of 90. Um, yes. So, yeah. 91, 92. Okay. So... I mean, this is kind of an interesting thing here. So Robin Harris was, a, you know, for people who, that know, was a, a legendary stand-up comedian. Funniest motherfucker. I mean, I mean, he was, <clears throat> I can't, uh, the, the comedian's comedian. Uh, I mean, he, I mean, he was, you know, I remember one time bombing, you talking about bombing, I bombed at the, uh, Comedy act because back then you had to follow comedians. It was Damon Wayne's, Robert Townsend, Martin Lawrence, and then me. And back then the comedy act was, uh, you know, at its height. That's when the Boston Celtics and Lakers was going at it, and Magic was in the crowd, and everybody, you know, <laughs> Al Jarreau and all these niggas. It, 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 it's packed. With all these a black a listers, and um, Robin brings me up, and I bomb. But my, I remember my joke that I thought was gonna kill him. I said, "Yeah, you guys probably seen me in a movie, uh, Shaka Zulu. I was a black dude with a spear." <laughs> so Robin would call me Shaka Zulu, but I, he said, "Hey, Shaka, Shaka Zulu, <laughs> Shaka Zulu." Um, so. Uh, after I bombed, he was like, man, come on. I'll see you tomorrow. Because when you got booked there, you booked two nights, Thursday and Friday. So, um, like, come back to, come, yeah, you got to come back tomorrow. Shit. Came back tomorrow, killed him. Killed him. Well, Robin Harris was only 36 when, when he, he died. Yeah. I thought he was older. I thought he was like his forties or fifties. Like, no. God damn, thirty six. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how did you How did you feel when you first heard that news? Man, you, you know what's so funny? You still kind of grieve. You still think about it when death is weird to me. I don't really. I don't go to funerals and shit like that because I try to treat people nice while they're here. So when they pass, I just kind of grieving sections, but there'd be times where I'd be driving along the road and I'd think about Robin and Shaka Zulu and, and then you, 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 you might get a tear or something, but, uh, you know, but it's like when it happened, it's just so powerful. It's literally like a star imploding. Oof. So when Tupac died, it was like, it was the same thing. Oof. Like what? I kind of, it was like, I had you like, okay. You know, you shake it off, and then you go. You just start remembering the the times. It's almost like a movie. Like, damn, like damn. Was I nice to that nigga when I was talking? You know, it was this. Uh, um. So it's like, uh, I try to pe treat people nice while they're here. So, you know, people be at the funeral. <laughs> Puffy had a song that says, I want y'all motherfuckers making 30 minute videos and all that bullshit. Show me the love while I'm fucking here. Hmm. I was like, <laughs> I want the love. I was like, yeah, fuck that. Um, so I try to peep, you know, what they hear. So when Robin passed, it was, you know, like a, it was like a star imploding. <laughs> you, you feel numb. Like damn, damn. Yeah. You know, it's like damn, really. You know, you don't believe it at first. Like, you know, fuck out of here. This is for the internet and all the other shit. Like, fuck out of here. Matter of fact, um, when I met Bernie for the first time, we didn't hit it off because I thought he was doing Robin. I didn't know he was doing Bernie. <laughs> Yeah, they have a similar kind of style. And I was like, Phew. and we we had a, um, 
a standoff. And it was so funny because one night we had to do, we had to do a, we had to share headliners, me, Jamie, Fox, who was cold as a motherfucker back in the day. Follow Jamie Foxx, oh my God. So follow Jamie Foxx and Bernie. Um, in Atlanta, at the original Comiac Theater, um, I was like, this nigga doing Robin Harris, man, what the fuck? And then I, I was, then he caught me laughing, and then we, 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 we it, was, it, was, it was a fucked up vibe. I remember that. And then um, we broke from there. And um, he did the Def Jam. And then it came to a point where we had to talk because we had to do a TV show. He, had to, he did a television show called um, Pearl's Place. Me, uh, Angela Means. Um, what's my baby name? Um, God damn it, my memory. Uh, Tic Tac joke with the sucking a, um, sucking a, suck, she, she got a joke. God damn it, what's her name? I'm such a fucking lady. Adele Givens. We all did a TV show. And before we did a TV show, the producers wanted me and Bernie to be brothers in the show. And Bernie's like, well, we, we got to sit down and talk because we got some shit to talk about. So he put me and him in the room, and we hashed it out, and and it was really some some comedian bullshit. And he told me something I, I always remember. He said, "You ain't gotta respect me, just don't disrespect me." <laughs> I said, "You motherfucker!" And from that day on, from that day on, we was that was. That yeah, and Russell Simmons produced that. Um, Russell Simmons and Stan Lathan. Mm. Um, I think Prince came down to the taping of it. That person like because Prince loved Bernie Mac. Mm. Oh my God, yes, yes. Um, I think he had a song with Bernie Mac going. I ain't scared of you, motherfucker. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember. I was trying to think what that song was. I, I know he had a song with Bernie in there because Prince came down to this. There were Prince's here. I was like, Prince ain't here. I was like, Prince came down to the show. Um, yeah, a song called The Pope. Yeah. yeah. With, with the intro is, I ain't scared of you motherfuckers. Right. Yeah. He, he loved Bernie. Yeah, so, he, yeah, Bernie was. You end up doing Robin Harris's voice mm -hmm. uh, on Baby's Kids' uh, animated movie, right? Right. Okay, can you still do that, Bernie? That that uh, Robin Harris? Not like I did it back then. I used to, uh, not like I did it back then because it was for some reason I would I would mock when when Robin would call me Shaka Zulu. I said, "Get out of here, you black motherfucker!" <laughs> hey, look like a big of a tree. <laughs> and um, that's how I got the job. Uh, we were down here in um, Atlanta, damn, at the Comedy Act. Because back then you only had one comedy club for black people. <laughs> Mike Williams' comedy act. And um, that was my closing telling me how, people how my, I miss Bernie, um, Robin Harris. And I would do Robin Harris just like a bit of it. And, you know, it was, I, would, I would get stand ovations on that. Mm. And um, it was a lady in the crowd. A producer, she's like, we're doing the big, the big um, baby's kids. They're gonna have Rich Little do Robin Harris. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're trying to get Rich Little to do Robin Harris. <laughs> I'm like, can he do it? I'm like, no. Yo, they're gonna have, they're, they're gonna have an old white guy doing Robin Harris. Welcome to Hollywood. <laughs> so they, Yo, this, this guy was born in 1938. <laughs> So <laughs> she she called me with Reginald Hudlin on the phone and some um people uh 
some Paramount executives. It's like, hey, Faison. I, I'm so sorry I'm forgetting her name. She's a beautiful lady. Um, so can you do can you do Robin for us? Uh, hey, motherfuckers. Black motherfuckers. Look at him. Look at him. Look at him. And they said, oh, but now can you do him just talking regular? Like every day, I was like, oh, I'm just talking regular. Is it, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is like conversation, regular conversation. I said, oh, let me see. Then I said, okay, you black ass kids, get in the car. You know, so that's how it came about. Okay. So then after that, you were in Meteor Man. Yeah. Well,. I think Meteor Man, yes. Yeah, that, Robert Townsend was hot as fire back then. Right, because uh, I'm Gonna Get You Sucker was already out. No, no, that's... that's um, oh, that, that came later? Yeah, well, it was, but that was that was Keenan, him and Keenan had... Oh, yeah, 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 no, no, you're right, yeah, I, I messed that up. Uh, Hollywood Shuffle, Hollywood Shuffle Hollywood was Hollywood Shuffle out. was a big one, but then... Um, yeah. Uh, Hearts, um, five heartbeats. Five heartbeats. That's the one. Yeah, yeah, that was that was the smash. Yeah, that was. It was. Yes, it was a very good movie, but it wasn't received well. Believe it or not. Yeah, but it's a cult classic. Oh, no, People still talk me. about B- it, Big it, Red it, it, to this day. Oh, yeah. trust me. <laughs> trust me. Um, he was, you know, and he had um, a assistant named Charlie, and Charlie had to, you know, back then they didn't have Twitter. So these people would have um, assistants and stuff. And so his assistant saw me at the comedy store and said, um, hey, uh, uh, I saw you at the comedy store. Uh, Robert Townsend is shooting this movie called Meteor Man. Um, I was like, oh, cool. He said, can you be um, at the studio at, you know, 830? I'm, I am thinking I'm going to audition. <clears throat> and um, so, you know, I get there at 8.30s, trucks and shit. I'm like, oh, shit. Damn, this is a movie. Okay, they, they doing a movie. Back then, I, I had only did about three or four movies back then. Um, I was like, yeah. And it was a, it's a certain energy back then when you were, you know, the smell of production. And you know what you know what I'm talking about. It was uh-huh. people moving shit. But the thing of it is... Climb the 54 and all that. And um, I, I ran into a PA. And I was like, hey, I'm here to um, audition. Um, he said, what's your name, Faze? Oh, oh, here's your dressing room. I was like, dressing room? What kind of audition is this? So I get to the dressing room. There's some clothes there. There's a helmet. I was like, he said, uh, Robert Towns will be with you in a minute. So I'm sitting there like, what kind of fucking audition is this? Still hasn't dawned on me. I'm not auditioning. This motherfucker has hired me to just do this. He's already, you know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. So Robert Townsend comes. And he goes, hey, man, what's up, man? Uh, oh, look, oh, yeah, it's crazy, man. So you got what we doing? I said, no, what are we doing? He said, uh, <laughs> uh, you, um, you're going to be upstairs, and uh, Bill Cosby's downstairs, and he's um, making a TV move and all this. And, uh, I said, I ain't got to audition. He said, Nigga, get dressed. <laughs> and left. And he was so happy what I did there. He was doing this um, sketch show called Tinsel Townsend. Um, he was like, man, can you come in, you know? Because I, I work off the head good. It's like, I can read a script. And I'm like, this shit don't make sense. Um, so he liked that, that I can read the script and go, this is what you really were saying. This is what you really meant. This is what you... And um, we did the Tinsel Townsend, a bunch of sketches, like, uh, contrary to uh, popular belief, people think Tyler Perry's the first... Robert Townsend had a studio in Hollywood back then, like a functioning studio. He took his money and bought a studio. So he was filming a, his TV show out of the studio. So, um, yeah. And then the earthquake came and crashed all that shit. <laughs> well, uh, 
Meteor Man was actually the first black superhero movie ever, I think. First black film done over a budget of $20 million. Really? Yeah. Well, I mean, it had, I mean, you you were obviously in it, but it had Bill Cosby. I wasn't, no. Bill Cosby did that movie for a dollar a day to help Robert Townsend with the budget. Huh. Yeah, Luther Vandross, every Don Cheeto, uh, Eddie Griffin. Mm-hmm. Um, Eddie Griffin was strong back then. He was killing it, you know. Um, uh, Sinbad. Everybody that used uh, Afro Sheen was in that movie. <laughs> uh, James Earl Jones. Yes, with the yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, uh, Marla Gibbs. Yeah, uh, yeah, man. Like y'all had a real serious cast. Now, I'll be honest. This was not the best movie. Of course, I mean, <laughs> they're not all. You know, they're not all gems. <laughs> you put a guy, you put, you put a comedian in a tight suit. Yeah, it's not gonna. But well, you give him that. You know, you give him. You know, that he. You know, he was, he was, mm. you know, he was, he, you know, he just had a, he was ahead of his time. Yeah. And he was, he well, was, mm-hmm. well, you had said there's a lot of scary dudes in Hollywood, but Robert Tans, Robert Townsend is the scariest I said, it, one. No, he's I know. a bitch ass nigga. <laughs> but I learned a lot from him. Like, I learned, a, we, the reason why I say that, because I know how smart this guy is. But when it comes to, I think it's the reason I don't, I don't want to. Let's go. Be, him and Keenan's relate, you know, because him and Keenan was like that. So when it comes to ride or die, he's not riding with you. He's going to take the Robert Townsend safe route. Hmm. So that's why I was like. I, I I love everything he's taught me, but I, I still say you a bitch ass nigga. Why you can't ride for Bill Cosby when he's the one that was fucking? He's been looking up to you for this media man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like, are you serious? This shit ain't about what Pac say. It ain't about uh, <laughs> riders and punks. <laughs> what, what <is> <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, but yeah, I I I, I respect his uh, hustle and uh, the the man he is. But I don't. He's a bitch when it comes to riding. If there's a fight, me and him ain't go. I'm not choosing him. <laughs> and if you, you go sit your bitch ass down. Go fuck with some cameras or something. You, <laughs> yeah, because he's not. Yeah, he wants to be uh, okay. A, on everybody's right side, but Robert, you, you, you can't be on, you, you know. And this, I can take this to him. Mm. Yeah. Well, after that, you did Fear of a Black Hat, You're right? Which was okay. It was like a fake documentary. Oh, oh, no, 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 Rusty yeah. Condiff. Wait, wait, hold on now. Let me tell you this. Yeah. Rusty Condiff wrote Fear of a Black Hat and CB4. Right. I like CB4 a lot better. Well, they had a budget. <laughs> <laughs> they had a budget. We didn't have no budget. You, know you know how I got that job is uh, auditioning, and you had to come in as a rapper. There was no script. So you come in as a rapper of your idea what a rapper was. So I was paired with these three other dudes. And they was like, yeah, man, I'm duh, 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 duh. And I sit there, and I'm not going to out talk these niggas. I just sit there and roll the joint. And after they got through talking, lit the joint <laughs> and pass it to them. I was like, is that real? Yeah. <laughs> You're hired. <laughs> <laughs> Rusty Cundiff, who was a director for Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, but then came Friday. Yes. yes. Okay. 
Same thing. Uh, so, how did you get that role? Same way. Yeah? Walk in as Big Worm. Because I hated auditioning. So, you, I had to go in as the person. Because, you know, they had this fake, uh, you know, hey, whoa, whoa. So I had to go in and be like, move, nigga. Fuck we doing here with all these bitch-ass niggas? I had to be Big Worm in the room. So they're cracking up. I'm like, what the fuck you, you know? So they like, oh, no. Oh, no. Because I remember when Chris, <laughs> I did went in there, and it was like, oh, by the time I got home, you got the roll. Chris said, man, I went in there, man, and they was bullshit, man. I was like, what do you mean it was bullshit? They was bullshit, man. I, and he go, who wants to do a movie with Ice Cube, man? He ain't did a movie since Boys in the Hood. I was like, nigga, you crazy? Me and Chris were together every day at, at this time. So, they passed on him, and they were trying to give it, uh, give it to, uh, uh, damn it. From DC. Funny as motherfucker. From DC. From DC. Oh my God. He's on a living color. One of the baddest motherfuckers out there. Uh, Tommy Davidson. Tommy Davidson. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Tommy Davidson was supposed to play Smokey? He, but he didn't show up. <laughs> okay. So they asked Chris uh, to come back in. So Chris's audition was so bad, um, and Tommy didn't show up. He came, uh, yeah, he came in. Um, he came to the house and said, "Cause we would always work on the shit first. I said, "Look, man, you gotta, you know, what the fuck, you gotta come on, but you gotta, you know." Matter of fact, we worked on it, and then Angela means Angela would always cook. That's where the food was. Angela was cooked. So we go to Angela's house and we do it in front of her. And um, she cooked some hamburger helper or something, or spaghetti or something. I forgot what to cook. I forgot what she had. Angela means to cook her ass off. So we're over there. She cooked cook the shit. And uh, after that shit, this nigga was smoky. All this shit was cracking. Chris called me from his first audition and said, I need your acting coach. They, they sent me away. Mm. And I was like, man, they don't want you to act. They just want you. Get over here. Just come over here. Because you knew him before from like Def Jam? Atlanta. Oh, Atlanta, okay. Yeah. I was the MC that brought him on the stage at the Comedy Act Theater. Okay. And then he came to my house. And I put on a pot of spaghetti, and I called Faison, and I was like, Chris didn't get his job. Get over here. So me, Chris, and Faison sat in my apartment in Hollywood for like three, four hours, eating spaghetti, talking shit. All right, say that line. Keep going. Say what you would say. Say whatever you think. Add something. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Don't you ever, never, ever, 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 bring your ass over here again. And when that pot of spaghetti was gone, he was smoky. Right, because I actually interviewed Angela Means, and she t said that exact same story. Said that, you know, Chris Tucker, they originally weren't really messing with him like that, and the three of y'all got together at her house, and you helped him actually start to kind of get in his... Yeah, you know, he was like doing his, you know, he was, Chris was frustrated because he thought D.L. Hughley or Dave Chappelle was going to come in and snatch the role. Because back then, Dave Chappelle had a TV show every, the thing was to do to get a TV show. And they would either give it to Dave Chappelle or D.L. Hughley. D.L. Hughley, in the last, but right before this, D.L. Hughley had a, um, TV show about um, uh, messengers or some shit, and Chris worked on that. And we worked on that, and he went in there and said, "Man, I picked Dio. You 
excuse me, fuck all these motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, he's like, are they gonna do it? What? I was like, uh, so, um, he thought, do you get what? So he didn't. He, he he said, fuck it. I said, nah, man. Trust me, you you can do this shit. You can do this shit. You you can do this shit. So um, we put the tick in there and all that shit. Like just, all all that bullshit. That's how we would do it. We did that with Jackie Brown. We did it with um, Chris. Didn't want to do fucking Rush Hour. I had to talk him into doing Rush Hour. <laughs> really? Yes. <laughs> 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 he didn't know who Jackie who, who um Jackie um Cham Sham. was, and I'm a big Bruce Lee fan. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? That's Jack. I don't know goddamn Jackie Chan, man. <laughs> he was set like we had planned on doing a movie called Country and setting it up. I think with Paramount and his manager at the time, Tracy, had did like a side deal or some shit. He was mad at that man. Fuck that man. Uh-uh, uh-uh. So he knew Brett because he fired the director on Mo- uh, Money Talks. Uh-huh. So Brett and um, Tracy and um, Arthur put together Rush Hour. And, um, man, I don't want to do this shit, man. I, wanna... I said, no, you, you got to do this shit. Because I'm thinking, oh, yeah, I'm going to be in this mall. I'm going to be next to Jackie Chan doing karate too, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you. You're doing this movie, right? He does. He says he's going to do the movie. Then he hires um, 5,000. I think it was, I think it was uh, Troy's. 5,001 to do all these. Remember those silver clothes that Puffy was wearing? Right. He wants all. He wants to wear this in the movie. All these, all this puffy shit. I'm like, nigga, you a cop. <laughs> you can't wear this shit. He had a Corvette picked out that he wanted the studio to give him. I'm like, no, no, no. And Brent was like, please talk to him, Faison. Please talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Chris, you can't. I picked that blue suit out. I was like, look, it was a blue one and a brown one. I said, like, pick one of these, nigga. You can, you can have a suit, but you can't have a puffy aluminum suit as a cop, motherfucker. He had gold chains and shit. No. I said, remember Eddie Murphy? He drove a raggedy-ass Nova in Beverly Hills. Cop. Mm -hmm. You can't be flashy. Hi, hi. So, uh, the Corvette um, um, transportation came up with that Corvette. I was like, yeah, that's yeah, that could be like a heirloom that came down that you fixed up, and that that's yours. The little you know Corvette, that, that that's that's doable, even though it's still a sixty thousand dollar Corvette, but it could have been passed down. And that's, right. Yeah. So, was the was the permed hair was that already in the script or was that your idea? Uh, the perm hair was that came from a uh, C style, big C style. Uh, one um Snoop's homeboy, he okay. looked yeah, he would he would wear that around. So I think Pooh put that in there because of because you know Pooh wrote that, right? So Pooh, uh, Big C style was always around. So he put the perm in there, the the uh, feather perm in there because of C style, Big C style. Okay, right? Because I remember yeah when Chris Tucker said, oh, "What's up, Big Perm?" I mean. Big worm, like oh, that he, was Chris like. Chris made that up. <laughs> you mean the big perm? That part? Him saying that? Yeah. Chris yeah. made that shit up on his own. Cause we was, we were, back then we were filming, we were filming on film, mm-hmm. and we were cracking ourselves up doing the takes, and Gary would get mad like you motherfuckers, cause we would do a take and we start cracking up. I'm only in the movie for two minutes. I mean, it's a very iconic two minutes, though. It's two minutes. So Gary was like, and they used every bit of, you know, what we did. All that playing with my money is like playing with my emotions. I got that from Peebo Bryson. Mm. So they used every bit of it, but we were laughing. 
Because Chris would do shit to make me laugh. Like, dude, don't. I'm trying to have a straight face. And he'd come over and he'd touch my perm. I'm like, nigga, if you touch my perm, I'm going <laughs> to. <laughs> It, it, would, it would take me. It would make me laugh. So um, <laughs> we, uh, yeah. So, but we got through it, and and um, yeah. Chris made all that up. Big perms. Like he he came up with the big perm. A oh, big perm. Oh, right, because I remember I had the DVD with like the the outtakes that didn't get used, and there was like a scene where like Ice Cube was high in his kitchen, and he oh, opens up his cat. Hated that. He opened up his cabinet and, and like your head was in there. Yeah. And it was like, you smoke my weed too? I'm going to kill all y'all. Like, and he like closed it real quick. Like, because he was like tripping off of weed. Like, me and Q both hate. I was like, why? Because they, they called me in. was like, hey, they added an extra scene. I was like, what? You, you're going to be in the cabinet. I was like, that's. I was like, Q, we got to shoot this. <laughs> what the fuck? I was like, why, why do we. Who's, who's coming up with this shit? I don't know, but you know they say they want to shoot it anyway. <laughs> man, your impressions are on point, man. I I, I didn't realize. <laughs> I, I didn't realize your impression ability here. Oh, I'm learning. Man. I'm learning something new today. Okay, so you know I've had a lot of the cast of Friday yeah. uh, on, on my show right. uh, over the years. Um, John Witherspoon was on. And uh, you know the one the one clip that kind of took off was he said that everyone made five thousand dollars on that show on that movie. Not me. I made twenty two hundred. <laughs> <laughs> but but the residual, the first residual I remember I got because Chris was at the house and um, we were at the house. I don't know what just I don't know what we were doing. It was a Saturday. It was a Saturday. And the residual came. I'm like, oh shit. And the residual was like eight grand or something like that. I was like, oh shit. I got it. So he takes his car, he takes my and goes to the boom, goes to his house to see if he got one. He got one. We go to uh go get go to the um Beverly Hill, Beverly Center, get fresh, and we go out to uh, Century Club that night. Mm. Yeah, that was like, um, but yeah, that was you know, eight you know eight thousand dollars in the mail back then was cool. Like I don't know. Oh yeah. Like <laughs> in the in the nineties, like ooh. So we, <laughs> yeah we. Well, uh, Paula J. Parker, I just interviewed her. Uh, she said she actually got more because she was already with a big agency. Did you get a paycheck for that movie? Yeah, I was signed with William Morris. Oh, okay. So you made sure you got your money. I didn't make sure. They made they, sure. They made sure you got your it, money. You know, I was signed with William Morris and uh, Three Arts Entertainment. And I was signed with the same people that F. Gary Gray was signed with. Okay. So, you know, I'm finding out in Hollywood, um, because I don't have literary representation, that you will get ganked if you don't have someone fighting for you during that time. I, I know I got 22. I mean, the, the movie only cost $2 million to make. We mm -hmm. were unknown. Everybody in the movie was basically unknown except for um, Cube and um, mm. Bernie Mac was kind of known. Uh, No, no. Bernie was... No, uh, not really? No, no. Bernie... No, not. Bernie was um still... Yeah, Bernie was, yeah, Bernie's, yeah, Bernie was still. Yeah. I mean, yeah. but you're right, yeah. I mean, uh, John Witherspoon wasn't really known. He was known, but he was known for, John Witherspoon, I think he has the record for the most times on um, John uh, Letterman. He and John and, and, and Letterman were, like, best friends. Yeah. From back in the day, but he, he was, um, and he was a writer, Mm -hmm. But he wasn't um, Friday. I think Friday really, uh, you know, that bang bang. Thing. And then when he was, he killed it on Boomerang with that. Um, you got to coordinate. Right. That's what I, you got to coordinate. I mean, John. I mean, so, um, but it was like basically, you know, in the hood we was known because mm -hmm. the the um, 
the actual movie was bootlegged first. Huh. Um, yeah, it was bootlegged. Like it was in, it was popular in the hood. People were like, hey man, you seen this movie called Friday? I was like, Fri- I think I'm in that movie. <laughs> Yeah, nigga, what the fuck? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Facts. Uh, okay, right. so the movie comes out and it's huge. It's, yeah. Well, I mean, to this to this day, I mean, when you talk about hood comedies, it's always at the number one spot. When Cube, me and Chris saw it for the first time, we. We, Chris, we was like, the fuck is this? We thought our careers was over. I mean, me and Chris was like, man, we fucked up. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean, <laughs> wait, nigga? You in the movie, the whole movie. I'm in two minutes of it. <laughs> I, so, um, they sent us to Howard University to do a screening, just me and Chris. I was like, why Why Cube ain't coming? It's like, he don't want to be a part of this damn movie either. So he's like... <laughs> So we go to Howard University to screen the movie, and um, our plan was to leave before the movie was over with. Let's leave, like let's duck out because I, I don't want to hear them booing and shit. Yeah, let's do that. So the movie is about to end, and we sneaking out, and we going down the it's like a little pathway. And the, the lady comes chasing us in the movie. And it sounds like they're booing us. Like they're booing. So we we trying to make it to the limo. And the lady's, where you guys going? I was like, we ain't gonna sit there and let them boo us. Booing, they, they, they're, they're standing up. I was like, what? So then we came back and signed a hell of a lot of autographs for the first time. That's the first time I was like, damn. And that's. Yeah, that's when we was like, oh, I guess the movie's good. Yep. Yeah, that's when we found out that's was good. And the premiere was just a weed fest. <laughs> 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 it was just like a reason to smoke weed. <laughs> at, the, at the Chinese theater. <laughs> so you got Snoop, Pooh, everybody in there. It's just a big cloud. <laughs> A weed. And Snoop had his, I mean, uh, Cube had his babies with him. That's when the babies, was, they was babies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, you ended up not doing any other Friday movies. Correct. Uh, you ended up doing, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the Players Club. I did, well, that was after, right after. Yeah, yeah. Friday. Yeah. Um, but, but, was there a reason why you weren't in Friday, you know, next Friday or Friday after next? It was no money. They wasn't. It was like really like they was like. I remember doing um. Players Club. I'm like, oh, Q about to write a check. Come on, man, just do this for me. <laughs> All right, Q. You know, you, I'm a fan. I'm a fan of Q. I, I like every. You know, I respect the. You know, uh, you got. You love Q. You know what I'm saying? All right, let's do it. And it was, you know, you do uh, we did that. Um, who was it? Uh, Bernie. You can't say no to Bernie and John Amos, Charlie Murphy. <laughs> and we had so much fun. Terrence Howard. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, you were one of the cops. With uh, with John Amos, John, yes, I was. Yeah, I was like, man, I'm being. That's what you and John Amos gonna be cops. <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. I get to work with with Florida, Florida. <laughs> <laughs> the right, the the, the dad God from Good it, Times. Child, Florida. I get to work with John Amos. Yeah, I mean, the dad from Good Times, the father from uh, Coming to America. Uh, My John Amos is uh, the Sydney Poitier films of him and Bill Cosby. Let's do it again. So I'm working with Kansas City Mac. (laughs) You know? Mm -hmm. Kansas City Mac. 
Um, well, well, AJ Johnson, I interviewed him, yes. and uh, he was he was in Players Club also. Yes, he was. <laughs> and uh, he claims that that he was supposed to be in next Friday, but Ice Cube Ice Cube did him dirty. How come you weren't asked to be in the other Friday movies? I was asked. But you were. They, yeah, it was uh, the, the second one. Next Friday. Uh, yeah, the next Friday. Q called me, and uh, we had a meeting. And we was talking about the money. And we came, we came to a number that I was getting. And we shook hands. And we was going to do it. And uh, it's like about two, two, three weeks later, I get a phone call. And I said, uh, that I mean, I was in the mood. I was going to shoot it. And I get a phone call. He said, he's like, man, they, uh, you know they shooting uh, next Friday. I'm like, uh, they, how are they shooting? I'm, I'm in it. How are they shooting? You know, yeah, they down on uh, like well, 105th Street right now shooting. So I get in my car and I go down there. I try to go on the set to talk to Cube, but he done already had me barred off the set where I can't get on. Oh, I'm so like, he knew that was coming. Yeah. I he done had me barred off. I can't I can't get on to talk to him. Come to find out that. He done hired the dude from Onyx to play my part. Fredro Starr. For way less than what he was going to give me. So I'm like, wow. But we done had this meeting, but you done went behind my back and hired him and yep. didn't nobody tell me? He said that he literally showed up to the set and he was like banned from this. He thought he the, they had a handshake deal or whatever. No, he showed up to no, the set and no, I listen. It's one thing I know about Q is everything is Q asks you once, <laughs> and then if it ain't going, it ain't going. It ain't it ain't no. AJ was went, went down there to cause some trouble. You know damn well he went down. He went, you know AJ. I know AJ. Okay. Okay. AJ will start trouble in an empty room. Okay. <laughs> so I'm trying, AJ went down there to talk shit. Because the first Friday he talked shit. Uh, the whole, the whole through. So and we loved him for it. But yeah, they they yeah yeah they you know I I can't. I wasn't there, but I can't really see Cuboy. I want you to come here, but then. Not um, be a man of his word. Yeah, that's not the cube I know. I mean, I mean, they've been. Uh, I think AJ heard something. What he wanted to hear, because mm. <laughs> when you you don't you know, because they called me and it was like, uh, did I want to do it for double scale? And I was like, hell no. Do you? Mm. <laughs> didn't the, didn't the first one make money? <laughs> right. Well, I mean, John Witherspoon said that he actually got a pretty big check for, for the other got, Friday movie. Out of everybody, I think John got the most money. I mean, yeah. Out of yeah. The, I forgot how much he said. I think it was like half a million or a million. It was like some big amount. I I believe him, but as I'm saying that you know that's every. This is they used to call it favorite nations, when <laughs> all the niggas would make the same amount of money. Favorite nations. There's no such thing as favorite nations. So it was like, yeah, if, if he says that, if John said that, I believe it. But yeah. um, they, 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 my role is really so small in the movie, I can see why they can't justify it. You know, it's like, I'm only in the movie for two minutes. So it's like, okay, I see why you don't want to pay me. I, I understand, ain't no, ain't no love lost. You see, we did those other, me and Cube did torque after that. Right. Well, I mean, but but just to be fair, although you were in the movie for two minutes, you were essentially, I mean, one of the main villains. You and you and Debo were the two villains in that movie. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but yeah, 
Yeah, in fact, you were, you were, I would say, the main villain. You were the one that was actually trying to kill people in that movie. Yeah, they, like, they, they, Debo just wanted to beat you up and steal your money. Big Worm, yeah. They, <laughs> Big Worm wasn't to be fucked with. <laughs> the way they did it, they set it up, <laughs> they, they set up nice. That's another reason why I was like, yeah, well, let's not mess with it. Unless it's, you know, this is some money involved. Like, because, you know, but I was happy with that and it could keep moving, you know. It's like artwork, you yeah. know. You never see Picasso say, you know what, let's go in and let's switch this up. Uh, <laughs> let's, you know what, I'm going to put my ear back on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but I remember uh, me and Angela Means, when I interviewed her, we talked about, you know, whether there was ever going to be another Friday movie. And we just kind of brought up the whole scenario of like, taking all the Friday movies and bringing all the characters back into one movie. Like literally Mike Epps and, uh, and you and Angela and AJ and, uh, it becomes, that be- you know, Cat and Cat Williams yeah. and, and just everybody and slow, throw rage in there for a second and, you know, just literally have a cameo from everyone. Just imagine how epic that would be. It'd be epic, but there's no money. It's like, you see what I'm saying? It's like, at, at, the, yeah. at the end of the day, you want to bring home some gifts to your family. All right. So you at, the, you at the movie theater, $75 billion. I did it for the art. <laughs> it's, it's dope. But you know who knows? Like Cube can call yeah. me again. Come on, man. Just do it. <laughs> yeah, <man>. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, John Witherspoon. He said that once Chris Tucker started doing Rush Hour, it was over. He was never going to do another Friday movie after that. After those types of checks. Yeah, those are some big checks. I remember I called. Yeah. Chris <laughs> got twenty million dollars. I said, "We rich. We rich." <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Rich! This nigga hung the phone up. <laughs> <laughs> we used to have some fun back then, man. It was, it was, well, it was, some, it was some good times. I mean, I, I love the scene between you and uh, Chris Tucker and Money Talks. That you know, when happened. you were in the prison cell, that happened. Brett, who was a new director. And I was down there. Um, <laughs> Chris Tucker was still Charlie Sheen's Ferrari. He said he would let him borrow it, but he would literally have this thing for weeks. And um, <laughs> <laughs> he so would he steal was, Charlie Sheen's Ferrari. Yeah, he was like, "Look, okay. come out and set. We're gonna take Fra- Charlie Sheen's Ferrari again." He Charlie Sheen had a bunch of Ferraris. So I said, okay, cool. I'm going to come out of the set. So I came out of the set. And Brett is one of the, you know one of those honest directors. Like, he'll ask a grip, does this shot look right to you? And it was like, he's like, yo, does this does this look right? Mm. Um, and um, I, me and Chris on the set, smoking a joint. And um, Brett says, man, you and Faison should do that scene. The 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 this, this original scene was a big guy chasing Chris around the cell, trying to fuck him. I'm like, nah, we can't do that. So we started smoking the joint. I said, oh, I know what we can do. And I had came two set wearing that red. And I, said, I know what we can do. I said, you just. Explain to me what happened. And um, Brett said, what are you guys going to do? I said, well, he's going to explain to me what happened. And then what? Well, let's see. Let's see. And I mean, literally, 88 takes later of of me and Chris laughing. Because we uh, cut. The crew, everybody's, I mean, we're, we're I can't breathe. We laughing so hard. He's like, come on, we got to get this shit. 88 takes one way. One way. One camera. No coverage. Just a, a master. 
We get we get one we get almost through one, then we hear fucking Brett laughing. <laughs> like, you fucked up our take. That was that's how that and it, it, it was like uh, I don't even think I got a check for that because it was <laughs> it, was it was just off the well that was your only role in that film right yeah I was we it happened me going on the set the the, the still Jolly Cheen's um, Ferrari with Chris and then Brett was like no let's just you know, let, let Faison do that because Chris was Chris was the producer at the time. He right. Produced it that was, uh, yeah, that was his film. That was his first, like, solo film, basically. Fired the first director and hired Brett. Brett mm. Radner. Yep. Yeah, Brett pretty much hit the ground running and never looked back. Yes. And he's always been the same, always been the same guy. Yep. Always been the same guy. I remember, uh, well, yeah, go ahead. Well, you've always, I feel like out of comedians, you've been the most outspoken in terms of calling people out. You know, we live in a very, you know, political, I mean, these days everyone wants to be politically correct. Yeah. No one wants to potentially piss anyone off in case there might not be a job it's for bullshit. them later on. Yeah, but, it's like, it's, yeah, it's like bullshit. You don't care, it seems. I don't. I mean, I can't care. I'm a comedian. It's my perspective. It's my opinion. It's like, uh, you know, and, and I don't really speak out of facts. I mean, I'm like, uh, you know, I'm speaking from like, what's the, you know, because nowadays everything is committee-based. Hey, you, you and me and we together, and then we all hate him. He can't say that. It's like the thing, um, I, I know you're about to bring up the Dave Chappelle thing, which when I, when his, the last special he did, and I told you, I said, that shit was fucking brilliant. Mm -hmm. It was brilliant. It was brilliant. And that's brilliant. what the fuck I was um, talking about. That's what I was, that was brilliant. That other bullshit is just some bullshit. I mean, if, if you yeah, have. No, I, I, I agree. I, I agree. I feel that, yeah, his last one was brilliant. And me and him talked sometimes. So I texted him. I was like, yo, like, you really pushed the envelope and didn't give a fuck. The, the other fucking... the other Netflix specials I thought were just just okay, was not impressed by them. And that's what I was saying. But this was... last one, the last one was so yeah. fucking on the money. I was like, God, that's now. I was like, I wonder if people understand what I was talking about because we grew up where you had to follow a Damon Wayne's. If you ever seen Damon Wayne's do his shit. Martin Lawrence was <laughs> Martin Lawrence. They was doing their shit. It's like I, I tell people like this, and I'm not taking anything from Dave. Dave's always been a nice guy with me, but I speak from facts. It's 1997. Are you gonna go to a Dave Chappelle concert, Chris Rock, Martin Lawrence concert? Ninety-seven, probably Chris Rock. Right. Two thousand one. Chris Rock, Chris Tucker, Dave Chappelle, Bernie Mac. Well, when was the Dave? When was the Chappelle show on? Came what on years was that? Two thousand five, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. Before the Chappelle show, he was still a relatively underground artist. Uh, Killing Me Softly was out, and I, I loved it, and my friends all loved it. You guys uh, kind of liked it because it was cute, but Killing Me Softly, Chris Rock answered that with bringing the pain. Ask Chris. I'm gonna rewatch it. Well, no, Chris Rock was the, was the king of that era in terms of stand up. Well, he point blank he, period. I, I seen him build it, boom. But he was always there in the pocket. Chris Rock was like, "Yo, I watched Chris Rock." I'm like, "Man, I ain't doing stand up no more." <laughs> yeah, he was that good. No, really. Yeah. And um, he 
it was it was not just it was rock. Um Martin. Uh it was so so many people that was uh, uh um then you got the Kings of Comedy. Right. <laughs> it was like, you know what I'm saying? It's like, what do you mean? I was like, what do you mean he's been the king? What do you mean? Where the fuck you get that from? Since 2005. No, I think the, I think the I, I think the Chappelle show is what took him to the next level because yes. yeah, once the Chappelle show hit, he sort of became iconic after that. Yes. And you know, and and I went to a I went to a stand up, you know, before the the Netflix stuff. I went to one of his shows in like Santa Barbara and I'm like I almost felt like he didn't really have the passion there anymore when, when he does his stand up. I, I, I know it was a great check and that's why he was doing it, but he didn't really have the passion and I didn't see that passion come back until this last stand up. Because he has something to say. Yeah. He was saying real shit. I call him speaking in his, his nigga voice. The other voice was the white man voice PV on how niggas are. I don't know you like, what was that? But his his nigga voice, like Richard Pryor only spoke. Richard Pryor thought he was Bill Cosby when he first started. He wanted to be clean. Yeah. But when he started talking in his nigga voice, talking about the pimps and his mama selling pussy. Yeah. That's the real. That's what I was saying because I I I'm I'm a student of this shit. I don't just do it. I've been doing this shit for years, and, and these motherfuckers act like I don't exist. Like, bitch, I'm on the screen and this shit. You can't fuck with me either or. <laughs> but they, I, you know. Well, you know, I was going to touch on Chappelle, but actually, I was speaking about some of the other people you talked about. Who? Um, well, you called Spike Lee uh, a house Negro. Yeah, definitely. Uh, as well as uh, Hannibal Burris. Definitely. Why? Why Spike Lee? Spike Lee was doing a movie called Malcolm X. Hell of a movie. Denzel was hell. Oscar. Th- that that was an Oscar. That was he got robbed for an Oscar. I don't there should have so. been Oscars. I don't Oscars so. associated with that film. I don't think so. You don't think so? Okay. You mean Denzel should have got an Oscar? Yeah, Denzel should have gotten an Oscar. Yeah. And the film, the film itself, I think I was Oscar like worthy. Spike Lee put himself in it. Like, why the fuck would you do that? Yeah, he always does, though. But that's what I'm saying. That fucks up the integrity of the film. Because a lot of people would like to know that character was a derivative of, of Red Fox. Red Fox was Malcolm X's best friend. Oh, I never knew that. Exactly. Because okay. this fuck put itself in the movie. <laughs> okay. Got it. You see what I'm saying? Red okay, Fox. Okay, I never knew that. Yes, look it up. They were they were popular. Yeah, I believe you. I believe you. So... Because he took that chance to enlighten people and go, let's play Looney Tunes. I'm like, why the fuck would you do that? But that's not the reason. I was like, that's just, to me, like somebody jacking himself off on film. He ran out of money to do the film, and he went to Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby's like, boom, here you go. As soon as Bill Cosby gets accusations... This bitch nigga don't do shit. Like, wow, why? I'm, and I got to think, about, am I the only crazy motherfucker like, I, who don't see this? And then it was a woman going, no, that don't sound right. I was talking to rape victims. They were like, that don't sound right. There's nobody stopping you from going to the police. There's nobody... There's nobody, and, it's, and you can't prove something that happened in 1655. <laughs> right. <laughs> How do you prove that? There was no proof. Yeah, no, I mean, Bill Cosby got railroaded. Uh, exactly. No one expected him to go to go to prison. I mean, honestly, and he, it, wait, it was one of those things. He's still in jail. He's still in jail you right now. You understand a first-time offender who does some shit like that? Doesn't spend that much time in jail, prison. Yes. Yeah. You don't. You don't go 
You, it's like, yo, you, yo, you did your, okay, three years, eh, just let them out. You get an ankle break. I know people who, who got work and then bop, bop, are free. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I remember um, I interviewed Eddie Griffin. Uh, and uh, and I remember that interview went went super viral, and he was just like he just broke it down. He was like, "All right, everybody knows Bill Cosby is married, right? So you have these women that are going up to his room of a married man right. in a private hotel room, right? What do they really expect? And they really expect just to go over a script in that room, like you know." His point was all these women knew the deal already. Now, if Bill was actually drugging them, that's kind of a different type of thing. I, I don't know about that. I point. never heard. He came up there and he uh, he put me down. He stuck the shit down my face. <laughs> right. <laughs> they talk about Molly and all this other bullshit now. Oh, I gave the girl Molly. If you give, if you buy a girl alcohol, then you you are you could be accused of rape. Technically, yeah, yeah. No, I mean it's it's crazy. Um, you know, you compared Cosby's conviction to Emmett Till, yes, which I thought was a little. I know. Uh, I don't know about that one. Yes, the same. What I meant by that, Emmett Till was from Chicago. He goes to the southern town. Whatever. The lady said it never happened, by the way. Right. They go into his family's house and get him. They go into the house and take him from his family that he's visiting and kills him. It's the same thing of letting people come in and and go to Mr. Cosby and go, he did it. We're going to take this nigga and put him in jail. And everybody go, that nigga probably did something. Are you fucking crazy? All these schools that he gave money to, they didn't get the money back. Right, but they took his name down. Take his name. Take it. Fuck taking his name down. Get the money back, bitch. Right. I lost respect for all these motherfuckers. Fuck them. Fuck them where they stand. Fuck them where they eat. Fuck them. Nobody, nobody came and said, and somebody says maybe it's 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 some huge. His son was well, murdered. I mean, Eddie, Gri- uh, Eddie Griffin. Eddie Griffin said it. He was the one that stood up for for Bill Cosby. And I um, call Eddie Griffin. You know, from what from what I understand, there was a, there was some backlash. I heard there were some deals that kind of may not have come together because of his stance. Yeah, my I remember Jill Scott was one of the only women, and they, they made her turn. Like, oh, maybe I was wrong. I was like, ah, oh. is 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 that's when I got to thinking: is what I'm doing is, is, is show business? Do do we really do I really need to be in this motherfucker? Is it really different from selling cocaine? <laughs> <laughs> Nah, not it's really. The same fucking, I mean, <laughs> the same ending result. Yeah, I mean, because I, I guess, I guess, really, what it is is like when you talk about this whole climate with the whole Me Too climate and everything else like that. And Dave Chappelle kind of touched on it pretty well in oh his comedy God. special. Fucking brilliant. And, and the whole thing is like, all right, look, if a crime was committed, you go to the police. They, if, if there's a rape, they they have a rape kit. They have witnesses, they have video cameras, they have this, they have that. You investigate it. If there is, in fact, a, a, a crime that was committed, there's prison time. If the person wants to sue, if they win the, the criminal case, the, the civil case is almost automatic. Right. You know, and you could get some money out of it afterwards, whatever else. But you're bringing up literally 20, 30-year-old events. There's no way, There's no way to really figure out what exactly happened apart from recollections and stuff like that. I remember I interviewed Russell Simmons right before all the sexual assault convictions came in. Like literally like a day before. And um, you have the, and look, and this man went and sold all his properties and moved to uh, Bali. 
Like hey, he I, was like, I'm out of here. You're not you're not gonna Bill Cosby me. Listen, I talked to him while it was going on. I said, Listen, I got you. I know I've seen women throw themselves at Russell. That at me. There's no there's no reason why an entertainer ever has to rape a bitch. It's pussy everywhere. Right, unless unless you're actually into that type of thing, we, we can't we can't rule that out. We that, can't. That, well, that's a sick we, we can't rule that out. Some that, some that people. Nigga had yeah. to have his dick yeah. chopped off. You know, you know, Jeffrey Dahmer was a good looking guy, but still killed a bunch of killed and raped a bunch of bitches. Like you know but, what I mean? But like, he wasn't a superstar. Right, right. But what you I'm saying, but he still was he still was a, a handsome guy that lots of women were interested. A in. handsome I'm, guy I'm saying, and a superstar. Wherever Bill is a little, bit, little walks, bit different. Okay, he leaves a, a a footprint. Yeah, he's that huge. Now yeah. back then, it was Coca Cola, NBC. So that means they were all in on it too. Mm-hmm. And the the he only likes uh, these bitches in Hollywood, not in nowhere else, <laughs> not in Atlanta where they filmed. Uh, Let's do it again. Not in Canada. Not in La- He travels. As a right. jet. Well, uh, how do you feel about Hannibal Burris kind of starting this whole ball that ended up just getting bigger and bigger? Well, I never. Um, I have been in Hollywood for years. I never, ever, ever heard of that. Ever. So for him to have, I'm like, how did he hear that? Like, where the fuck he hear that from? I'm like, oh, that's well, some pri- privy house nigga shit. Well, to be fair, you know, D.L. Hughley, who's a regular on my show as well, um, he had been hearing that, and he got into it with Bill Cosby on the air. O- over, that's why over... he been hearing that. And me, me and D.L., my nigga, we, I had this. We had the same conversation. Bill Cosby told me why I'm saying he. Bill, Bill Cosby called and Chester. He did it a certain way. His uh-huh. shit. So he came up a certain way. Way harder than we ever had to. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So he did it a certain way. And it's like a master seeing a a master kung fu artist seeing a kid kick wrong. He, what are you doing? Kick like this. And then Dio felt a certain way. No, this man be hitting me, hitting me on my head, telling me how to kick and all that shit. I know how to kick. How to kick. But a lot of people don't want to take the discipline. I'm not saying Dio well, should have. Well, I, I don't know if it's... Okay, I, I see what you're saying here, but, you know, Bill Cosby, I, I understand that he's a master of what he did and, and, and he was extremely successful, more successful than pretty much anybody else. I'm not even but talking I've about heard, th- th- that part. I'm talking about... Right, no, no, right. But I'm just saying, like, I've heard so many stories. Like, um, like for example, I interviewed Tamala Jones. Tamala. Right? Yeah. Okay. You know, great, great actress, long career. Um, you know, she told me that, you know, she was working on Booty Call and Bill Cosby uh, called that whole movie disgusting and anyone that's associated with it was, was disgusting. Um, you know, Eddie Murphy, when he did Cars with Comedians, you know, uh, getting coffee with Seinfeld, he said how Bill Cosby showed up at one of his stand-ups and was like, yeah, you know, you're doing it wrong. You shouldn't, you never talk about how much money you make. You know, come, come see my show and I'll show you how it's done. You know, Bill Cosby would always berate and belittle black comedians. Listen, okay, listen to me. I mean, I mean you, you, you know these stories. I know these stories, but I, have you ever studied Kung Fu? Uh, karate, back in the day. Did your master tell you everything he was doing was right? No. He is a man, and I'm not saying that they should listen, but they're going to have an opinion based on their teaching and where they came from. That's why yeah, Bruce, but it's, 
I, I don't know, man, but it's comedy. It's 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 a it's it's, it's art. No, like, it's you know, not, you, uh, comedy like, is not comedy. Comedy is politics. Okay. All day long. That's why Hannibal Barris has a fucking career. This fuck is about funny as my goddamn shoe falling off. <laughs> okay. I mean, you tell me this nigga say something funny, not really like where. What the fuck is this nigga saying that anybody gives a fuck about? It's politics. Comedy, this whole business is politics. I have a ceiling because I don't play politics. Mm -hmm. Okay? I'm 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 Richard's son. My I I I I we don't do that. Right. My you've been in a are, lot. You, but you've been in a lot of movies. Politics or not, like your I, your filmography is pretty deep, man. That's before politics, gay. I came from the era where the mob ran Hollywood. Mm. You were working with men. You were working with fucking men, smoking cigars, Lou Wasserman, making deals. Mm. Let's get this shit happening. Yeah. Where did, Lou, Lou Wasserman where was a gangster. The whole town. Yeah. Hollywood was built on gangsterism. Yeah. I was like, where, where? But then it became, let's be friends. <laughs> let's everybody work together. <laughs> what? Okay. <laughs> well, you actually supported uh, Jesse Smollett. <laughs> no, no, no. I was the first to say that was bullshit. I was the first. I did a whole video, or <laughs> I did a video with Dennis Rodman in a red hat because <laughs> I was like, "This that's why it's so brilliant." With um, if you look, I did a video. I was like, "Who the fuck goes out?" at two in the morning for a sandwich. In Chicago. <laughs> but then after it, everybody was ostracized. I said, look, he's gonna be ostracized. I said, he's our fuck up. Cause I was the first to call him out. I felt sorry, like I just left the brother out there. He could be, he feeling like shit. I don't know why he did it. I, I, but he's our fuck up. What right. we tend to and, and, do is, is, is go, now it's, we're ostracizing everybody. You fucked up. Everybody's going to fuck up. Well, his fuck up was on a whole different level. Though, everybody's right? and, and, fuck up. Listen. Right. Do you, do, Cause, you, cause, do you know who Robert Downey Jr. is? Yes. He Major used to wake up, up in people's houses high as a motherfucker. Right. He was able to. To come back around and become one of the biggest motherfuckers in America. Yeah, Iron Man. Right. Because his community took him in and said, we're going to help you. We're going to fix you. You fucked up, but let's go. We don't do right. that. Well, I'll be honest. With Jesse, I was a little bit on the fence until I saw the video of the police showing up to his house and he saw the rope like around his neck. When I'm I like, oh. heard the story, I said, bullshit. <laughs> Ain't nobody, if you ever been in Chicago when it's snowing, you ain't going to Subway. You 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 better go to Maxwell Street, if anything, get you one of them poke chop sandwiches. But you ain't going to Subway. Yep. And then you said the guys who were wearing a hat and the mag the it was Magnum hats saying racial slurs. Knock it off. Knock it off. That's that knock well, that bullshit off, man. Uh, Jesse Smoulet. What did, what's the name? Juicy, Juicy Smoulet. <laughs> oh my God. It was yeah. yes. Dave, Dave nailed it on that one. Oh, but if you look at my Instagram, I did a whole video called The Whole Town's Laughing at Me. And um, I showed the Subway sandwich, Dennis Rodman in the um, 
that hat, whatever the red hat is called, MAGA hat. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, <laughs> people are like, you think it was fake? Fake? Come on, knock it off. That don't, that don't, niggas make nigga moves. That ain't a nigga move. Well, you and uh, Cat Williams got into it back in the day, back oh. in, I guess, 2012. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I guess he owed you 50000 Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, what was that over? We're going on tour, and um, I was just getting my legs ready for tour. So me and Cap met. He's me. I'm doing Chris Tucker. Uh, you know, Cat Williams is just a ham of bitches around him. And he has a dog. He's like, man, you you know, you should open for me. So um, I was like, well, I ain't really open for nobody. But and Lance, my homeboy Lance, on was um. Working with, I worked with him before. He said, "Yeah, you should open for Cat." I said, "No, I ain't really." So, the first date was in Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona, and I came out there and did the phase on thing. Boom! Blew the blew the shit off, and. They were looking like I, I was gonna do some bullshit ass. Hey, you didn't see Friday? No, I was like, I'm, I do this shit, really. So, I he was surprised that I came was came so hard. So he says, okay, we're gonna do it again. There's another show. He sold out. Um, the next day, did it again. Boom, boom! People are like, what the, what, what? Yeah. He gets on stage. This is when he got into it with the essays. I was like, no, you can't be doing that. You, you can't be, no, no, no. No, no, no. He got into it with the essays. A mad e cop. I said, no, 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 no. You can't do that. Then he got, then um, little Jeezy came down. And we're like, we're supposed to do a show in um, Vegas. And um, let me tell you about Cat real quick. Cat is a loving guy. The cat I love is the real Cat Williams. Um, what's his name? Real name? Um, he is a give you a shirt off his back. And will help you any kind. I, I've seen him give, hey man, you know, a loving guy. His uh, his real name is uh, Micah. I love Micah. Micah is so respectful and so encouraging. That's the guy. I was like, okay, we're going on tour. So. But I'm talking to Cat Williams. I said, Cat, let's go to Vegas. He says, no, I want to hang out and go see Jeezy. I'm like, no, nigga, let's go. Because I was like, he, you're the only one he's going to listen to. I'm like, let's go. Let's go to Vegas. We got a show there. UNLV. And um, he stays in Vegas. And there's a big brawl. He's right in the middle. Jeezy. I'm like. We're in Vegas. So anyway, get to Vegas. I'm on stage. Ah, you see Cat looking like, does this motherfucker know he's not supposed to <laughs> blow the stage up? Whatever. We named the tour. Um, so we're going on tour. We're going on tour. You going on tour? We going on tour. We name it um, Outlaws of Comedy. The next date is in Cincinnati, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I'm in the room, and I get a call from the promoter, 
And the promoter says, uh, you can't say he don't want to pay you. I said, oh, he going to pay me, blood. What you mean he, he going to pay me? Where he at? Um, let me find him. The promoter, he real cool, brother. Um, there's a cat, cat, cat's paying you, but he wants to, uh, pay you, uh, thousand dollars I don't know blood that ain't me no where cat at Michael Blackson is there cat comes to my room like 14 nigga <clears throat> like what's up with the money blood straight to it he goes uh what they they said now he turns into cat he's a cat Williams now they, the, what I heard, no, no blood. Fuck that. And fuck all these niggas in here. Because they can get it. On bloods. I'll be right back. He goes upstairs. Black comes to me. He said, hey, why don't you come upstairs? Go upstairs. He counts the money out. All right. Go do the show. We did Cincinnati. But after that, it was five other shows. They were they did. You no, know, ten shows. And his and they promote, you know, said I was gonna be there. And when when I, when they when they would show up, they would say Faison Love couldn't be here, he's sick. And somebody asked him, um, why where's Faison at? And he said, Faison couldn't fill this room. If it was his funeral, and I said, I'm going to fuck this little motherfucker up. I'm about to fuck this nigga up. He, he done said the wrong shit. That's that bullshit. So I was like, yo, not only you out of pocket, nigga, you owe me 50 grand for all those fucking places that you advertised me for. He becomes buddy-buddy with Shug. Like, that was going I'm like, nigga, me and Shook go back, nigga. You don't know because you knew the L.A., you fucking idiot. So he's with Big Sight. Rest in peace. We're at the back of the, um, I think it was called the Supper Club in L.A. Big Sight said, hey, man, cat over there, he tripping. I see he over, he, he got my fucking money. <clears throat> me and Otis go over there. We walk over there, cat. Oh, what you want to do? What you want? You know this bullshit. This is, I'm like, come on, blood. <clears throat> what you what do you want to do? What do you want to do? Pulls out a gun. I'm like, oh, you gonna shoot me? You gonna shoot me, nigga? Shoot me then. I don't need a gun. I don't need a gun. He puts the gun down. And my homie Otis go picks the gun. He said, it ain't got no bullets in it. <laughs> <laughs> I try to chase this motherfucker. I'm out of breath. <sighs> Wait, you, you were chasing Cat Williams? I, want, I, want, I, want, I want to beat his ass even more. He goes to get a rifle out of the truck. A rifle? Oh, he, had, he would carry guns, <laughs> all these guns, right? He gets a rifle out the truck. I'm like, oh. But it's the people are like, man, come on, what are you doing? They trying to stop him. What are you doing? What are you doing? And they put the uh they took the rifle away from him. And then me and Otis said, man, let's go. I got I need a drink. <laughs> so we go in the club. Uh and then that's when I heard he got arrested. He talking about Faison's out here snitching. Do 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 he's on snitching. Uh 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 I'm like, man. Nigga, you run around a, a parking lot in Hollywood with, with a machine gun. I don't need to do that. I, I'm in the club. I, I had no idea. So uh, the parking lot attendant, somebody called the police on him. And they came to arrest him. And um, then he hooks up with Suge. And um, we see me and Suge and Kat <laughs> see each other at the comedy store. He's like, Suge, there you go. And they all do it. <laughs> Kill him. <laughs> 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 I mean, 
this shit, I'm just laughing like, what? <laughs> nigga, what is, nigga, this is pain, what, what do you mean? Nigga, this, I know you knew the L.A., nigga. But no, it don't work like that. So, um, yeah. Okay. But, uh, yeah. Well, you said that Cat Williams is gay. Yeah, I think he's gay. I think he's uh, hiding in his closet or whatever. With, okay. I is that him. because you're mad at him or do you no, really no, have No, no, because I just seen him. Lena, uh, who's been riding with him for years, this girl has his back. I mean, uh, when I ever see a guy really abusive to a woman for no reason, then she can't defend herself. Um, and then, you know, in the little antics, and uh, that's a little weird. That, you know, that's, it's, it's, you're hiding something. And then he got caught in Atlanta with the boy in the closet, you know, the uh, cat, <laughs> it's a 911 call. And the cat wing won't let me go home. Oh, oh right, that, huh? yeah. And I, I remember that. No, I yeah. mean now that you say, it, yeah, yeah, that, that was weird. Then you got into, yeah. People forget that shit. Uh, right. He also got into a fight with a little boy too, which was <laughs> really Who strange. Does that? Like, Who fights a little boy? <laughs> and you want to fuck with me? You can't handle a fourteen-year-old child. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I've seen you fight before. There's some video footage of it at the airport. Yeah. Was it uh, was in Columbus? Yeah, Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. Yeah. I just watched it again as I was talking to you, and goddamn, you threw this guy around like he was a, a rag doll. It's unfortunate, man. It's like uh, I don't travel with security or nothing like that. It's just me because I, I always go back to JFK. I was like, he had security people all around him, and they still got him. So. What, you, what, you know, if I can't win the fight, you know, okay, all right. Um, I'll, I'll take, I'll, 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 you know, I'll take a fair one, you know. But don't get a fair one, then start bitching and crying because you lost. You know. Well, that that fight happened. You you beat this dude's ass. Mm -hmm. You you really beat his ass. Um, well. I know you were on probation for a while. Are you still on probation? No, I'm off now. Yeah, I'm okay. Probation is so, a good thing. <laughs> probation reminds you of, <laughs> you know what, if I just do this, I won't be in trouble. I was going to bed early and <laughs> eating healthy. <laughs> I was like, probation kind of reminds you, yeah, if I did this, uh, I might be a, yeah. Okay. Uh, so... Uh, and the guy actually, did the guy press charges against you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was just a, like a simple assault, basically? Um, it, it was, uh, in Ohio, it's so funny because in L.A., you would never go to jail for that. Right. Something, it's a regular fight, it's just, okay, we'll, you know, but in the, you know Columbus, it was a thing because uh, they arrest you, they got to put you in jail so you can cool off, so you get booked, and then the bail was two hundred bucks, <laughs> but you can't bail out till the the next day. Yeah. Like, Right, so luckily that didn't, didn't turn into anything more serious. It's life, man. It, it comes along with the territory. People know me before I see them. Right. And they really think I'm Big big Worm or whoever or whatever. Some people go, oh, that's Window, whatever. And it's uh, because there's no security. I remember one time <laughs> this dude hit me in the back of my head and it turned everything in my mic not to kill this motherfucker. I was like, you don't know how disrespectful that is. And it, it was because his girl told him, what are you doing? It's a grown man. He called himself, hey man, what's up, dude? Bop! And I I mean, it took everything in my might not to break my foot off in his, I was like, I see why people have security. But I, you know. 
Oh yeah, I, I have security when, when I go to certain events. Just because it's just easier to let a professional deal with it. And when people see security, they kind of keep their distance anyways, especially when they see it's serious security. Like even even gangsters don't really come around like if they see a serious security person. I don't know who you've been fucking with, but... Well, when your security is like police, you know what I mean? Oh, like, yeah, no, yeah. No, no one really wants beef with the police. I don't yeah, care how deep you are or whatever true. else. That's true. Yeah. I never thought about that, but, you know, me, yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I never thought well, about that. But, yeah. But, you know, when they you eat, they got to eat, too. Right. <laughs> uh, when you fly, they got to fly, too. Like, exactly. right, you ready, boss? Uh, <laughs> but it does. Was there... Was there a word in specific? Was there like like a final word that this guy said to you at the airport that made you finally snap? Um, yeah, he, he, he got he spit he spit on me. He got spit on me. He spit on you. Yeah. What what type of man spits on another man? Listen to me. <laughs> it's wild wild west out here, and it's like um. People have no filter. They forget they're not on Twitter talking shit. And they do these things because they know, they think I have piles and piles of rooms of money and rooms of money, money and money. I have no money, guys. Listen, there's no money. There's I drive a, a Nighthawk, a 1974 Nighthawk motorcycle. Okay. Okay. There's, I made twenty two hundred dollars from Friday. I've invested it well <laughs> in soybeans. There's no money. Okay. So people, women, they think there's they're gonna get these piles of girls have lied and said they've had my baby. Like, bitch, he's white. <laughs> Not my kid. What are you doing? He has eyelashes. Everybody's got eyelashes. <laughs> well, uh, you know, we, you were talking about the whole L.A. thing and, and how you've known Suge before and everything else like that. You've been using blood when you've been talking. I mean, are you affiliated with that at all or no? I was raised in 5800 block, Old Memory Lane, Uptown, San Diego, California. Blocks! Okay. How how deep did you get into that when you were when you were in it? It's like you just it's it's your set. It's where you, you eat, you Thanksgiving, you play football in the streets, you go to the dance, you fight. If you don't fight, it's a you know, um that's what it was about, you know, low riding and um then it got into dope selling. Um, right. Um, it's, it's essentially it's about your set, your neighborhood. This is our neighborhood. Anybody comes up here and violates, we win it. That's essentially what it, the real uh, ours football. We, you know, um, It's not, it's not like I was driving around shooting people like that. No. I remember when uh, we first started hanging. The reason why we was hanging out with, uh, when I first met Snoop and uh, Big Seesaw, because Snoop always had, he was always 100 a Crip. And, <laughs> and we used to call Crips E Rickets. And he was like, You hanging with them E Rickets? I'm like, Nigga, them, them niggas cool. They always had the weed and Popeye's chicken over there. <laughs> so we always hung out with them. They was always cool, uh, always cool. Uh, I remember me and Nate and um, Sean Dog playing pool at tracks. Um, so it was actually a beautiful thing, actually, because we had this one thing together that. You know, it's a common bond that, you know, yeah, these niggas that know that code. It's a code. A lot of these dudes is making up these gangs. They don't know the whole, they don't know the code. They don't know the code. 
Yeah, I mean, I've interviewed a lot of serious OGs, like Big U. Just the um, army, all day long. You know, uh, Mob James, you know, who brought all the bloods over to Death Row. Uh, Melvin Farmer, who was one of the founders of the A-Tray uh, mm -hmm. Crips. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people, yeah. a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of serious, serious criminal figures like that. And, um, yeah, I mean, you look at, you know, I, I feel like right now, is the most telling time when it comes to people wanting to have gang affiliations that really should not be gang affiliated with the whole Takashi thing, where, where these guys accepted, these nine Trey Bloods accepted this outsider kid because he had money and some fame and so forth, and he turned around and brought that whole organization down. He told on everybody. They all are getting like 15 years, 10 years, 12 years. It's crazy. And that's they said too, nine tray. I mean, yeah. Why are they making this shit up? When the gangbang was fully on, on fully gangbang mode, they was break dancing in New York. I saw it. It was nothing. The only people associated with Bloods in New York was the Latin Kings. Mm, okay. Only. They had the spades. Um, damn, what else? Bronx River. Um, I taught little Petey the game. Y'all call him Pistol Pete. He grew up in the 875 building. Like, this was blood, me, woop de woop woop. Little Petey. You heard of Sex Money Murder? Yeah. We call him Little Petey. Y'all call him Pistol Pete. Ah, uh, okay. Pistol Pete, I heard of him, yeah. The real Pistol Pete. Not the rapper. 875 Boynton. Mm. But I was like, where New York was, that's why I love New York, because I remember wearing khakis. <laughs> so we usually wear just croquet sacks. And coming downstairs, 875, these niggas lit in my ass. What the fuck are you wearing these goddamn Bruce Lee shoes for? Crocus hat was these comfortable ass uh, slippers. Yeah, house shoes, basically. Yeah, but you, but you, you know, you was there. Yeah. yeah. I've been wearing them in New York in 1982. Well, you said that. Tupac could be alive if he didn't cross Snoop. No. I, I, I don't know about this one. You read that wrong. I read it wrong? Yeah, that's wrong. Okay. So so clarify for me. Let me clarify this. Okay. Let me explain to you like this. Snoop. Okay. Well, well you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote because we, we did an article about, about it. And you said, I always felt when Pac died, it was because Snoop could have stopped the whole thing. No. Snoop was a crip. That's my Pac story. I said Snoop. No. No? No, that's... Snoop was the biggest rapper in the world. Okay? Uh, arguably, because Tupac was... No, no, no. As, no, as no, big, no. if not bigger at the time. No, no, no. I'm going to have to respectfully disagree with this. I'm going to go ahead. I was there. So was I. I was... I remember when everybody called Pac a... Rapist and wasn't fucking with him. He was considered a troublemaker. Okay? After he was always in jail, and he was like, oh, this is a Tupac crazy ass. Me and Pac got into an argument about him not buying me a sandwich at Track. This would be a Track's, uh, a Track's studio. He's like, I'm going to get some sandwiches, you fat nigga. Y'all know you're hungry. Nigga, I ain't hungry. Anyway. Beautiful brother. But at one point, the world, the news called them Tupac. And they were calling him a racist. And all these different bullshit cases was coming up. Snoop came on the scene and it was the biggest rapper in the world. Agreed. Okay? Yeah, I agree. Snoop 
a real crip. Mm -hmm. Suggested to the homie, hey, we should bring whoop, 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 pop over. Because mm -hmm. back then we were all, everybody was, you know, everybody was, you know, only person I would you would see real Snoop with, um Pac with was really was Tretch before he went in. Him and Tretch whooped off thirty niggas at the comic store when Eddie Griffin was on stage. I heard about that. Yeah, I was there. Oh, you you were there when that whole I fight happened. I was there. It's a comic store. Okay, <laughs> what what was that fight? What was that fight over? I don't know. They just start fighting <laughs> chairs and shit. I'm in the back. Me and Chris like, what the fuck is going on? The SWAT, we go out, we come outside. SWAT is on the buildings like this. Lay down. The whole sunset, lay down. Yeah, uh, Tupac was wild. And Tretch was too. Tretch had his back. Yeah. He was slinging it. Woo! He was slinging that chain. He had a big chain around his neck with a lock on it. He took that <laughs> off and was rock. Rock. Wow. He goes, you know, so I don't know what it was about because we was in the back looking at Eddie Griffin and the chairs start flying. So Pox in jail and his redeeming song that everybody's fucking with is Dear Mama. Right, while he was locked up. He had the number one, he, he had the number one album in the country when he was locked up. Me Against the World. I remember that. Dear and Mama. Yeah, yeah, Dear Mama. Everybody You're right. felt it. Everybody felt it. Huge song, but he was locked up, and so he wasn't doing promo. People would start to forget about you when you're in prison. Yeah, the glasses I got it. on. I'm like, oh, yeah, damn. I got it. I got it. But, and when Snoop, you could say that Snoop was at his height with his first album, Doggy Style. That was his biggest album. No, you got to still He, he, still Snoop, be, he was still Snoop a major a star. He had a one-two punch. Because he had Dr. Dre's album first. Right. He bubbled. Yeah. Him and the Dog Pound bubbled off of that. They was kings. They were. And you're <laughs> so absolutely then, right. Okay. So then. But then. Okay, go ahead. Here comes. do 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 do. It's over with. It's Tire Records on Sunset. There's a line. What, what the fuck they waiting for? White people waiting for Snoop's album. Let's get the fuck out of here. Okay. It's a lie. The biggest rapper, Snoop. Trust me, that at the time. Now, listen, let, let me just say this. Okay, okay, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. He suggests to the homie, Suge, and I wasn't there for that, but I, I remember when Pac just gets out of jail. There was a club call on Vine, and Pac comes in with Suge. You know what? This nigga's out of jail. What? The fuck? Hops into a, a rag jaguar. Boom, he flashed. I'm like, oh, this nigga crazy. Oh, fuck, crazy. He's out of jail. They go to the studio. Me, come to the studio. I'm not going to the studio with this nigga. There's going to be trouble. Snoop suggested this whole thing. Snoop mm -hmm. takes a back seat. Get at it, homie. Remembering, Snoop's a real crib. Shug and, and Pac become Yeah, homies. Right? Mm-hmm. Then the shit with Dre is happening. You got to understand what Dre means to Snoop. It's three people that started Death Row. Suge, Dre, and Snoop. Well, and, and DOC, but he kind of got pushed That out. too. That, that's right. right. But who's, who's gone now? Dre. Dre leaves. And then, uh, well, Snoop is still around, but... Snoop is still around, but he's kind of like... Yeah. Okay. Pac is feeling himself. He's going at Dre, saying stuff about Dre. Snoop is a, a loyal mother. He was like, yo, nigga, that, that's my... 
This is the nigga saved me. Mm-hmm. The fuck is you? So, him being a comrade, he kind of just, you know, I'm going to just see how this ends. I'm going to just see how this turns out. Right? Pop starts to caution it. M.O.B., blood this, and I'm like, is he talking about the mob, or is he talking about the mob lane? Is he claiming should sack? Now, you got to understand, the nigga that was riding with you is a crip. Now, for you to claim blood, you done created a line. At death row, the crips and blood, everybody got along good. But when Sort of. Got- sort of. I've, I've heard some other stories, but more or less they got a lot of stories. Right. People got their ass kicked at, at death row. <laughs> you heard some disciplinary stories that I, yeah. I wasn't there for. Yeah. I've always been treated great over there. Nobody's ever. Right. And I know Eric, too. And I've never, ever. So when Pac got there, there's a line put in the sand. Mm-hmm. It's the mob. And there's some real Crips. Big C Styles on there. Sean Dog. You got to stand. Snoop just beat a murder case. Yeah. He don't want no smoke. At, nigga, what are you doing? Pac is going. At, duh, 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 duh. He's bringing Jay-Z. I never even heard of Jay-Z till Pac said, I know. Who the fuck is this Jay-Z nigga? What the fuck is He's going at I don't know who this thing is. I know who Nas is. He's going at everybody. Mm-hmm. Snoop is like, ah, this nigga is, is really banging on his bloods. Is it bloods and crips? Are you? But he chose that side. Snoop's a crip. Now, what I was saying was. I'm pretty sure Snoop got out. I'm like, man, dang, no, no, no. We making records, homie. We we winning. We don't even need to do. You don't even need to do that. If Pac had to listen to that advice and not went like when he got the, 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 this nigga that he got into was a crib. Yeah, it, Orlando Orlando Anderson. We we real, did a lot of a real crib, uh, right? Whose uncle was Keefy D, who I actually interviewed. Real, real. Yeah, okay. you've seen this interview. You've seen the Keefy D interviews. No, I no, but I I no, but yeah, I know who he is. Right. Yeah, he was uh, he was in the car when when the the Pac shooting happened, and he he laid it all out. If Pac and Snoop had been a lie. Snoop being a real crip could have been in there like a real crip and hey, hey, we good. We got we gotta let's watch this. We about okay. to music. I, I, I feel you, but although Snoop was a Long Beach Crip and uh-uh. the Crips that they got into it were were uh Southside Compton Crips. Completely yeah. different set. Okay, but they Crips. Yeah, but they're Crips from completely different it sections of town. To Listen to me. We, that's the whole thing about being a crip. You gonna connect unless you got a rivalry. Like you, you, you really gonna be rivaling with this crip gang, right? Like the the rolling sixties and eight tray gangsters that have been beefing for that, like, that, that you know, for, forty that, years. Who are that's the first crip on crip war that right. happened in L.A. Right. Well, yes, that, that, this, you gotta say uh, there used to be way more crips and bloods. Right and. And but but to be fair, also Southside was beefing with with Bob Pyru, so Snoop was not going to line himself with Southside. As I didn't he's say line himself at, with at him. Death I didn't Row, say line like, himself with him. I said yeah. can squash it. Like yo, that's okay. Snoop got a certain ambassador at being a real crip and being an ambassador of some street shit. Like, Pop, okay. Let me sit down with this motherfucker. Let's let's squash all this bullshit right here. I feel you, um, but I just want to make the point. I just want to make the point that 
although Snoop was one of the biggest artists in the world, was huge, when Pac came out and dropped All Eyes on Me, mm-hmm. you have an album that ended up going diamond. No, no, of course. But I was saying right. at the and, time, and, Right, that, and I just that, want to say that, that, that n- not only... Right. I mean, not only that I'm the album end up going diamond with huge songs that are still played to this day, but you had all the drama around Pac also with the with the arrests and the fights and this and that. That made him a bigger celebrity than damn near anybody, including Snoop at that time. No. At uh, okay. that time. Agreed to, agree to, agree to disagree then. It's a fact. I was there. It was like, you got to say, Pac was a movie star. That too. He was beating up the directors. <laughs> right. He, he, well, he, he beat up the Hughes brothers. He actually didn't end up being in that. He was originally in that movie. But no, I, I remember I interviewed Spice One, who, who kind of laid it all out. That's right. So he didn't do those movies until after those records came out. Well, Every, he did. Back, back he, then. He did, he did Juice. He did Juice before. No, no. He did. No, of course he did. He did Juice. Do you know how long Juice, and then and then um, gang related, and then um, right. Uh, well, well, poetic poetic justice that came out before he went to prison, also, right? Yes, it did. Yeah. So he was already he was a bona fide movie star by that point. He definitely was. Yeah. But he was not the pocky. <laughs> That's what uh, <laughs> Janet made him take a a test or some shit. Yeah, an HIV test to kiss him. Yeah. Right, because he had a bunch of group, he had a bunch of groupies in the all the time. Yeah, uh, yeah man. Well, listen, I've I've done more pot coverage than just about anybody. I was there. Um, oh, yeah. Listen, when Pot got into it with the police in Atlanta, we was there. We was all staying at Breed's house. Okay, yeah. MC Breed and Pac were real close. I, Super. Ask close. Warren G. Who was there when they when when they did? I got to get my. I got to get George. Oh, you were there. I was there. If you look at the okay. liner notes of Warren G's, um, you remember the liner notes? He would always thank uh, Faison and Chris Tucker for being in the studio. His first album. We was there, man. Mm. You know, and also when someone dies, they become bigger automatically. Of, you know, no, especially listen, when they die in their prime. <laughs> when he, uh, nobody, we love Pac, man. He was. He was, you know what I'm saying? He, but I remember Pac being called a troublemaker. And a lot of times uh, we had to fight for him. Like, you know, like, what you mean? Oh, the girl said he, remember it was, this girl said he raped him. Then the, he got the thing with the police and the police paid him some money. He bought the coop. <laughs> um it was all this little stuff, and it, it, and it sounded like, damn. Back then, getting in trouble was like, yo, nobody was trying to get it. We trying to get some money. So everywhere he was associated with, it was like, he was, it was, it was trouble. A beautiful yeah. person. I remember one time uh, Chris was talking about him on stage. <laughs> he's talking about <laughs> he said uh, Chris why you tell everybody uh, Chris said Pac he said, why you tell everybody uh, my mama do crack <laughs> no no Pac's my mama said why you tell everybody do crack he told um, Chris you, uh, I'm gonna let you I'm gonna let it go or you guys the only one can talk about me or some shit Pac was beautiful but he, he was a homie he, you know he was like who had some flaws and I and I think, uh, you know, and that's that's. It should be lessons learned from that. I think people are standing on that, like, yeah, I'm gonna do it like Pac. Mm. Yeah, I yeah. No, I, I mean, think the, that's what he would. I think you should would learn from it. Well, yeah, I mean, I've had a lot of talks, you know, I, I, I've even, you know, me and the Outlaws, well, me and Edie from the Outlaws are actually really good friends. Uh, you can you name all the, the time. Outlaws? Can I name all the Outlaws? Yeah. Uh, let's see. Edie, Young Noble, um, Fatal, 
Um, shit. Shit. Um, Gaddafi. The later. Uh, who, who got killed. Um, mm-hmm. There was one more who's really like super low key. Mac 10. Mac 10 is an outlaw? Not that Mac 10. It was a Mac 10. He was an outlaw. Oh, okay. I, I don't it was know. An original about that. outlaw from a thug life. Oh, okay. Right. Because some of the, you know, Big Psych kind of became an outlaw also. Uh, I interviewed Big Psych right before he died, man. That was my Good homie. dude. Good yeah. dude, man. Me and him literally argued back and forth in our interview. Like, yeah, how you going <laughs> to argue with us? We there. <laughs> I remember Big Psych then. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I fuck with Big Psych, man. It was a great oh, interview. Man, he man, he no, died man. right afterwards, man. So so sad. We, uh, like I said, real we, sad. We, uh, it was a very interesting time, man. It was a beautiful people, and I, I see Snoop now, and he's having so much fun uh, as what he's doing, you know. And I'm like, that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to have fun. This is supposed to be fun. This is supposed to be, hey, we found something else to do with this that's positive, that's helping people. And I think these kids are trying to, you know, take this, you know, especially the dope selling. Like, these niggas ain't selling no fucking dope. You kidding me? Well, you had mentioned, you know, we talk about violence. Um, you mentioned that someone pulled out a gun on you and you took the gun out of their hand? Cat Williams. Oh, that was Cat Williams. You took the gun out of his hand. Otis, he put the gun on the floor and Otis took the gun. Okay. Yeah. And then I, he, went I, and got another, he, yeah, he went and got another gun. He went and got a rifle. <laughs> <laughs> like an army rifle, like with, with not a, you know, like, there's no clip in it, but you don't know. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. Like that, you're a comedian. You have what are you doing? What are you doing? Would you say that Richard Pryor is the is the greatest stand up comedian of all time? Him and Bill Cosby. It's hard. That list shit y'all be doing is bullshit. Let me tell you that that greatest rapper bullshit. Is bullshit. Get rid of that bull. It's because of these. Richard Pryor has some blessings and offers to offer that that Bill Cosby doesn't because he Bill Cosby works clean. Lenny Bruce. My v- favorite comic, a guy named Freddie Prince. That's who really I was like. I used to study Freddie Prince. You remember him? Hold on, the name sounds super familiar. Okay, uh, Freddie, Freddie Prince. Okay. Yeah, that was my guy. And then yeah. um, Richard Pryor is just—you can't fathom. Bill Cosby, you can't. Bill Cosby told you to your face that the Bible was sketchy in the sixties. Mm. If you ever listen to a. Um, his his um piece about um uh, uh, Noah God telling Noah to build a boat a ark right what's an ark <laughs> <laughs> uh, Michael uh, um uh, George Carlin Red Fox. Jerry Seinfeld, Eddie Murphy, all these colors of comedians you can learn from are brilliant. I used to follow Jerry Seinfeld at Dangerfields in in New York. He would go on at one o'clock in the morning and because he would just go on I would do uh, like the uh, <laughs> one thirty, 
two people in the audience left. But I would sit there and watch, like, okay, I get it. Colin Wolf. There's so many. Uh, Rich, uh, Richard Wright. You ever heard of Richard Wright? Sounds familiar also. Hold on. See, this is people don't study. I study brilliant comics. Richard Wright. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, this guy. Right. Um, Sam Kinison. I should. Sam Kinison. You remember with Sam Kinison? Yeah, of course. The, the screaming guy. <laughs> this is what he's saying, though. I know he's screaming, but he's brilliant. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, man. I mean, Godfrey is one of my all time favorite comedians. I love Godfrey. Yeah. I love. You know, Godfrey used to work right for Bill Cosby? Yeah. Yeah, he used to work on a show. Yes. Yep. That's how bad he is. The, the Wayne, I mean, Damon Wayans. There's so many different. That's why I hate these fucking top ten lists. There's no top. Nobody ever puts the Rolling Stone in the top ten. I mean, people people do lists. They don't put the I mean, fucking pe- rock and roll bands. Yes, in. they do. Who? Did they put? The, what's, I what's, mean, all, all all time bands. No, yeah, I mean, no, no, they never do this. I mean, people constantly make basketball lists, NBA lists. They know it's only with niggas they put these lists together. Nobody has a rock and roll ACD. You can't name the number one top rock and roll band. Because you can't. It's too many. You got Elvis over here. He contributed this. ACDC, Clutch. <laughs> oh. Yeah. The uh, Beatles, Ray, Led Zeppelin, Metallica, Ray, Queen. Machine. It's too many different colors. There's no list. Fuck that list. <laughs> It's bullshit. You can't do it. Well, uh, I, you spoke I, I saw the interview where you was talking about, uh, and Lord Jamal was there, and he was like, nigga, you better say my fucking name. I'm even <laughs> saying it, but I, he had to look, because he's so New York. <laughs> well, you mentioned Mike Epps was going to play Richard Pryor. And you said that you know we don't want we don't want to see jokes or see a Richard Pryor impersonation. We want to see like a Jamie Foxx who became Ray Charles. Yeah. I, yeah, I, there's only one person I think can play Richard Pryor. That's a guy named um, Jeffrey Wright. Oh, the the actor. Yeah, that's the only person. Huh. I, I would yeah, play. I know. At one point, uh, you know, and, and this is actually a real friend of mine. Nick Cannon was supposed to play uh, Richard Pryor. And... That's my guy. We mean friend of yours. Yeah. yeah. Come on, that's my guy. I, I, I was like, yeah, I, I don't, I don't see it. That's my homie, you know. That's my guy. Like, that's a... But. I mean, yeah, he can't, he can't pull off Richard Pryor. He put he put off some brilliant like people say Dave Chappelle um, created a new sketch. No, Nick Cannon created a new sketch, a former sketch. What he's doing, no one's ever done before. I can't do it. Only a certain a rap comedy off the, off the hinge of that's some brand new shit that's never been done before. Mm-hmm. Ever, Dave yeah. Chappelle, you know, Carol Burnett, Flip Wilson, Saturday Night Live. It's just sketch. But what Nick does is fucking. It's brilliant. He called me the, the first when he first put it together. He said, "I want you to do my show." I was, I was like, "Tell me what it is. It's, it's we rap. We uh, I can't rap. You know, no, no, you're good. <laughs> no, no, no." I can't do nothing. I can tell some jokes, but I can't do none of that shit you talking about. It's fucking brilliant. They, now they think on their feet. Oh, yeah. I went on there yeah, and no, they bombed. Yeah, well, Wild and Out is an institution. What are they, like 12 seasons in or something crazy? Like Yeah. They won't, yeah, they yeah they got to break. Yeah, they, yeah, Nick is very proud of him. Very oh, yeah. proud. Me too. I'm just saying he can't play Richard Pryor. I mean, I just, I, I, I don't, I don't see it. I'm sorry. It goes without saying. I can't play. Yeah. I can't play Elton John. It goes. <laughs> okay. You know, although, although you did say that that Chris Tucker could play Big Worm now because he's gaining so much weight. Yes, true. <laughs> Chris Tucker, big as a motherfucker. We both can't be Big Worm, nigga. We have to pick one. <laughs> no. 
<laughs> he's a little throaty. Um, <laughs> um, well, you've said uh, the Cedric, Cedric the Entertainer and Craig Robinson are are safe. They are, yeah, they're safe. They're safe. They're safe. They're safe. Who else? Who else w- would be safe? Steve Harvey. <sighs> He's safe-ish. <laughs> um. They know. Uh, listen, I basically created that lane for Cedric. Uh, we were doing Parenthood, and then they said, "Oh, we need a fat black nigga on every network." <laughs> and then. <laughs> Cedric um, and Craig. I mean, uh, besides Ernie Hudson, you weren't seeing any. You weren't seeing a guy like my face in these big films. Ernie Hudson, I, I him and um, oh my god. Um, well, Ernie Hudson, I, I admire a lot. You know who he is, right? Yeah, absolutely. Stan Shaw. Um, amazing actors who wouldn't play a black guy but just a character in the movie. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It's one thing to play. Say, nigga, everybody act. Everybody gonna do it. And then just a couple of treat. I was playing a guy who was lost in this with this love affair with this young girl, but it wasn't a black guy. It was just a guy. Um, I think with Cedric and, um, they go straight for the black thing. Hey, man, ain't no white people in my neighborhood. What? So, not, I mean, what I mean safe means say this. I've never said what unless it made sense. Um Okay. All right. That makes sense. Right, because you've turned down a lot of roles before. Yeah. That was when you can do that because this thing called integrity, because your last role was what they remember remembered you for. You know, because we've had lots of Lots of discussions, you know, with actors over the years about turning down roles, you know, and like, for example, Michael Jai White, uh, who's actually a, a good friend of mine, you know, we talked about how he would never wear a dress in a role. Mm-hmm. They brought it up once and he was like, nah. You know, ever had a role where you were going to dress like a, you know, dress like a woman in that role had you accepted it? No, I, it was it was a part of a comedy uh, I was doing a, um, a sitcom, and it was just a quick suggestion. I was like, oh, "Can't I'm, I'm not doing that." And it, oh, okay, cool. It was, just, it was not, <laughs> that, that it, was but it was not that, yeah. no conspiratorial type of thing like that. Okay. But then you bring up like the Malik Yobas, who said that they That's want to wear they, they, they want to wear a dress and they want to push <laughs> themselves in terms of their acting ability. This is before the whole trans transgender thing came out. I want that role though. Yeah, absolutely. So you want a role where you? I want the roles like. that remove take me furthest away from who I am. It's easy. I can give you fifty-five different versions of a black man. How do you want them? Jamaican, African, Spanish, poor, white, well-spoken, hood, southern, whatever. So in my one-man show, Hall in the Hollywood, I play over fifteen characters. My show is set in a therapist's office. Uh, one of the main characters is Gladys Ro- Rosenberg, who's an old Jewish woman. She's a therapist. That's me. I play two trans characters in it. I play an old Spanish man. I play an old Italian guy. I play an old Jamaican woman. So for me, we're vessels. And the goal is to show humanity in all of its fullness. And... I'm half man, half woman. My mother birthed me. I'm half of that. That's some that's some other shit. I don't know what the fuck that is. 
<laughs> that's I don't know what that is. That's some. I don't know what that is. I mean, I you know uh, the dress doesn't do, the dress. Listen, Flip Wilson wore a dress. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't about the dress. It was about the character. Right. So you you can't really just say it's the dress. Um, It's a transformation of a character. Um, I get that. Um, Would I do it? How funny is the character? Does it mean I put a dress on, now I'm sucking dick? Come on, man. <laughs> right. Come on, man. You, you, Come on, man. You should be that. You, you, People should be more secure. The dress, uh, it, if it's funny, it has a place. Everything has a place. Right. You know, like for example, uh, for example, I, I interviewed DeAndre Bonds, no. right, and he talked about how his biggest regret in acting was when he got raped in that one movie, the, the Three Strikes. No, no, like Lockdown, I think. Oh, uh, Three Strikes too. Oh, he got raped there too. Yeah. Uh, I mean, <laughs> hold on a second. Uh, hold on a second. Lockdown, yeah. And he, he basically said that, you know, he just didn't want to do it, but it was in the script, and he finally agreed. I guess, like, a white dude raped him in that movie. Uh, I didn't actually see the movie. But he said he went back to his dressing room and cried oh, after. Shit. I hate to hear that. He's such yeah. a good kid, and he went through a... He's such a good kid. Yeah, man. well, he, he actually killed somebody, sort of in a self-defense like, accident yeah. kind of capacity, but he still killed somebody. I pulled up and playing loud music, triggered something in him. He came and he attacked me and with no words or nothing, just I defended myself, couldn't win. And um, wind up pulling a knife and just getting a, um, stabbing him one time and he died. Stayed there trying to help him, waited for the ambulance, and he lost his life. Uh, he called me right after that, his uncle. Yeah, it was his uncle. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, and uh, we tried to get some, uh, a good, um, yeah, he's such a good kid, man. Um, I, I hate to hear that, man, because it's like uh, I wouldn't have done it if I'm gonna feel that way. You know, look look at Ving Rhames in um, Pope Fiction. Right. Yeah, he got raped in that movie. Yeah, it, I mean, not just raped. He had the ball in his mouth. <laughs> right. The whole the whole nine. <laughs> he, he with the whole nine. The guy was yeah. watching. <laughs> it was like that's a lot. That's a lot. You got to know these images will be forever around. Oh, okay. So if if you got offered, if Quentin Tarantino called you up and said, "Hey, I got a role for you. <laughs> You're gonna be a big gangster, but at one point <laughs> they're gonna put a red somebody ball in your mouth and rape you. <laughs> somebody's gonna stick something in your ass. <laughs> yeah, because you know what? He the way he cut that, he didn't. He never showed the revenge. He says. Y'all, we're going to get medieval. And then they cut to him leaving. No, I need people to see <laughs> the other side of this. I know, go back to me punishing this love. But it, it's, right. you got to understand, Hitchcock said it the best. It's just a movie. Oh. It's just a But movies do put scenes in people's minds. Right. Because let me tell you, you could say it's just a movie, but I had Danny Trejo on my show. 
who well, I've never who met. Was, well, I want to meet. I love oh, that yeah. guy. Oh, oh, man. It was one of my greatest interviews ever. And he was friends with uh, Pegleg, the co-founder of the Mexican Mafia. And when Edward James Almost did American Me and showed the head of the Mexican Mafia getting raped, 10 people died over yeah. that film. That's Ten different. people, both in prison and out of prison, like people associated with the film and so forth. And there was uh, there was money on Edward James Almost's head for a while. The person in charge of that movie made a lot of mistakes. American Me. Yeah. Edward James Almost. Yeah. Okay. A lot of mistakes. Do you know him? He'll admit it. What, do you know him? Oh yeah, yeah. He, okay. Uh, I I saved his life really, and he won't admit that either. Well, okay. So from what I understand, you know that. That story was based on the head of the Mexican mafia, right? And fr from from what I heard, the big problem in that movie was that he showed that guy getting raped. That was one of them in, in juvenile hall, uh, and that's considered the biggest no no. Right. And then <laughs> and then he lied about getting permission to do it. Aha! Uh -huh. He said he went up to talk to Joe Morgan, and. Uh, Joe, Joe Morgan, Morgan is the guy? Yeah, Joe Morgan told me, no, he didn't. That was so you problem. talk about it's just a movie? Well, Ten people well, literally people. lost their lives over, over an editorial decision. <laughs> Think about that. No, no. That's, that's the code. That's their code. Yeah. They have a code. Mm -hmm. Fuck that movie. We have a code. Right. Nobody raped us. Like, <laughs> you're not no, going to say our main guy got, got fucked... In juvenile hall? Nah. No. We have a code, and you will follow right. the code. Yeah, and he claimed that he okayed it with the guy, and the guy said he never talked to me about that shit. So. Mm -mm. Yeah, that, yeah. But, yeah, but, yeah. But, see, that's what I'm saying. It's like. Yeah. You know, you could say, is, yeah. You could say, uh, uh, you could say surviving R. Kelly. That's just a TV show. R. Kelly's in jail right now because of that TV show. Right? Right? Right, yeah, but it, that's the world we live in. <laughs> yep, it's, it's like did that shit happen? I'm like, I'm, I'm, eh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you know, and then the Michael Jackson thing, you know, that bullshit. leaving, that leaving bullshit. Neverland. Yeah, that's like what, what, what? right. You know, but I just want to say, I don't know what happened to the Michael Jackson thing. Did it happen or not? Not quite sure. But I, I just interviewed I just interviewed Jason Weaver, who played young Michael Jackson yeah. in, the, in the Jackson film, yeah. in the Jackson TV series. Right. And even the guy playing Michael Jackson said that he wouldn't leave his young son to spend the night at Michael Jackson's house. <laughs> uh, parents left children with Michael. Yes. Uh, yes. And all that, and you as a father know that you would not do the same thing with your child, Michael Jackson, or anyone else? Hell no. You, you know, no. It, pick your favorite singer or actor that you look up to. You may love Denzel Washington, but you're yeah. not going to leave your 10-year-old son at Denzel's house for a couple days and let Denzel Hell sleep in the room no. with him. You see what I'm saying? It's one of those things where Listen. I think Michael, Michael brought it on himself by associating with little children like that to that extent. I know, no, no. Okay, right. we can agree to disagree on this. No, because I think, see, what you guys are confusing is an act. And Michael Jackson, from what I understand, is a very smart businessman. And most of these things, the animals and all that bullshit was an act. Okay. People would drop their kids off at his house. I mean, you know, you know, oh, okay, yeah. You know, he's what I'm gonna do with these kids. I mean, to, you know, when I I was invited to Neverland, Chris was like, hey man, Michael wanna meet you. I was like, man, what are they doing up there? I, and I sounded stupid. And I was like, well, what are you doing with them kids up there? I believe the bullshit. So you think I would bring my kid up there if he was doing that? You brought your kid to Neverland? 
No, no, no. Chris Tucker was saying, hey, Michael would like to meet you. I was like, well, what the fuck's going on up there? Oh, okay. And he's like, you think I'm going to bring my kid up there if they were doing that bullshit? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's one of those things. Leaving Neverland just won an Emmy, which, uh, of course you know. it did. It's bullshit. Bull- <laughs> Listen, like I said, when I saw Michael Jackson climb on the roof of the car, when he came to court late, I right. said, this dude was innocent. Right. Well, because Eddie I- Griffin, Eddie Griffin, actually, I interviewed Eddie Griffin. Eddie Griffin drove him over there. Yeah. Yes. They got there late because there was so much, like, you know, so much, you know, people in front of the court that they couldn't make it through. But yeah, Eddie Murphy was the one that, that I mean, sorry, uh, Eddie Griffin was the one that took him over there. You actually went to court with him during, yes, the, I did. during the whole. The nigga rode in my limo. He was so ler- nervous he didn't book a car. Mm-hmm. I drove from my house in Malibu at the time down to Neverland. And him, Catherine was in the car, and uh, I think it was Jermaine. And we pulled up and they had the fucking red carpet rolled out at the courthouse. <laughs> Rolls of motherfucking cameras. I'm like, nigga, is this a movie for me or a court date? Yeah. And Michael was nervous, nigga. I was like, this ain't nothing but a hearing. Yeah. I said, I done been to court when I'm figuring out how much time I'm getting. Yeah. You walk in and say guilty or not guilty and you walk the fuck out. Yeah. And the nigga walked out, jumped on top of the SUV and yeah. started dancing for the fucking fans. I remember that. The judge was mad talking about we late. If there's 10,000 people on the fucking street, we in the car, we on time, we can't get through the motherfuckers till the police show up and move the crowd out the way. Right. Yeah. Yep. So, he comes there late in pajamas. Somebody who's been to court a lot no, you don't go to court late. You court started at eight. You there at seven thirty sharp with regular clothes on. Yeah. But a man, I ain't got, I ain't got nothing. What, what do you mean? What do you? This is what do you mean? This is stupid. He gets fourteen counts. Nothing. Not one count. Yeah. Fourteen. Not one. Yeah, man. Well, it's one of those things where uh, no one's ever really going to know, but people are still going to love his music. Thriller is still, I would say, the greatest music album ever done to this day. Uh, People argue with Thriller and Off the Wall. I say Thriller. People say Off the Wall. Both of them are certified classics. Um, You know, it is what it is. Eddie Griffin uh, spoke highly about him. They were actually good friends. Um, You know, he said Eddie Griffin actually talked about how he would make pedophile jokes around him. (laughs) So uh, anyway, we got the bouncing ideas and shit. And my brother runs out the room. He's like, nigga, I can't believe you. Y'all motherfuckers is finished each other's sentences and shit. So Michael's like, sit on the bed. I'm like, nigga, that's how you got in trouble. Sit on the bed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you're making pedophile jokes. <laughs> like a motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, look, phase on love, man. Definitely, it definitely. It was worth the wait. It was worth the wait as uh damn, it's like two and a half hours in. Uh, you know, appreciate you coming in, talking your shit and keeping it a hundred and not being politically correct, not holding your tongue. Uh, wow. You know, you have so many iconic roles from, you know, of course there's big worm, but you know, and I can't believe it was only two minutes of that film. Cause you really stole the show. Two minutes. That's it. Two minutes. Two minutes, and the you know the filmography is crazy. Uh, you know, you were an elf, which we didn't talk about. One of the classic Christmas films of all time. That was. Um, trust me, that was yeah. That this John Favreau. That's you know. Yeah. That's when, you know, he wrote Couples Retreat for me too, and made. Oh yeah. Yep. So. Couples Retreat is another one. Uh, but there's something special about having a Christmas film because that just keeps getting played over and over and over and over again. Oh, Every Christmas, people are going to watch Elf. You know, I put it up yeah. there with the great ones like a, a Christmas Story and stuff like that. Well, the uh, guy who produced uh, Elf was in Peter Billingsley. Is in 
Christmas oh. That's Peter well, Billingsley. The, 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 there, you, there you go. <laughs> there you go. It makes perfect sense. Peter but I know who's the kid in Christmas Story produced Elf. Oh, okay. Well, that makes perfect sense then. That makes perfect sense, man. So appreciate that's, you that's coming that's in, that's man. My, my crew. <laughs> yeah. Congrats, man. Congrats on everything. And you're still doing it, still doing stand-up on a regular basis. I know you got film projects coming up, TV projects, man. Congrats. And to be a working actor in Hollywood, I think it's a huge accomplishment. Spanning back, what, 20-something years now? Yeah, probably almost 30, yeah. Well, almost good. 30 years, man. Congrats. Congrats, Thank you, man. man. I appreciate it. No doubt. <laughs> Until next time. Peace. <laughs>